hearing of the House Rules Committee. Committee members met to consider the rule to allow for consideration by the full House of two economic growth and tax proposals. The proposals were recently passed by the House Ways and Means Committee. One of the measures is a version of the President's economic recovery package, and the other is an alternative offered by House Democrats. The Rules Committee heard testimony from a number of members of Congress about the two plans and about the rules to govern debate when those plans reach the House floor. Among those testifying, Congressman Dan Rostenkowski, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, House Minority Leader Robert Michael, and Congressman Bill Archer, the ranking Republican on the Ways and Means Committee. We take you now to Capitol Hill for our coverage of today's proceedings, which were gaveled to order by 10-term Democratic Congressman Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. now come to order. The matter before the committee is H.R. 4210 from the Committee on Ways and Means, the Economic Growth Acceleration Act of 1992. There's been a request for a filming of uh, portions of today's proceedings. Any objections? No objections. And because of the subject matter, the committee will be held to the five-minute rule. The committee meets today to take testimony and grant a rule on a tax bill. We are here today because our economy is stagnant, because people are hurting, and because our confidence in the future is weak and getting weaker. We are here today because the President, to his credit, demands fast action on a bill aimed at getting the economy moving again. Democrats and Republicans have different versions of how to revive the economy. We have different ideas on how best to create jobs. Democrats and Republicans disagree about who should pay, who should bear the burden of producing a fiscally responsible tax stimulus plan. We disagree about the need to undo inequities in recent tax policy. On the differences between Democrats and Republicans, I'm sure that we will hear much more. But I think time is to act is now, and I think all of us believe on that. We should vote on the President's tax plans. We should vote on a Democratic alternative, too. No bidding war, no gimmicks, straight and fair. I think it's time to act. Mr. Solomon. Chairman, because I have some uh, real concerns about, about this hearing, uh, if I might make an opening statement <clears throat> and submit uh, by unanimous consent a long version and summarize real fast under your five-minute rule. Mr. Chairman, this bill before us today is being brought under four disturbing circumstances, any one of which should give this committee cause to be concerned about what is happening to our legislative process and the role this Congress has in solving national economic programs. Taken together, they compromise, I think, a searing indictment of the Democrat stewardship of this institution and its seriousness about really enacting economic reform. And I, I really say that with all sincerity. Let me just list uh, those four things I feel so concerned about. H.R. 4210, Mr. Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and uh, all the rest of you. Uh, that bill was introduced by the majority leader, supposedly by request, is being brought to us under the false pretense of being the President's economic growth program, when in fact it is not, and everybody in this room knows it. Second, H.R. 4287, the bill being brought to us as representing the position of the Democrat majority, was not subject to an open deliberative process as required by the rules of this House, but rather was drafted behind closed doors. Uh, third, the Democrat bill violates, and this is just, I just can't believe this, it violates the 1990 budget enforcement agreement 
by abandoning its pay-as-you-go requirement in favor of higher deficits, that same agreement that all of you in this room that voted for it <coughs> swore to uphold as the price for a tax increase. And fourth, and finally, the amendment process is being imposed by the Democrat leadership, I think, intentionally designed to divide the House along party lines and provoke a veto confrontation with the President. Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important at the outset of this hearing to set the record straight, to blow the whistle right now on the partisan games that are being played at the expense of the American people, the American people who want us to work together and not uh, fighting this in this partisan way. First of all, let's make it clear that in his January 28th State of the Union address to this Congress, the President outlined a comprehensive economic growth program that consisted of two parts. Two parts, a short-term seven-point plan that he asked us to elect, enact by March 20th, and a long-term plan to give us the economic growth uh, more than just a jump start. Now, the seven-point short-term package was introduced by our Republican leader sitting over here, Mr. Michael, on February 7th, H.R. 4200. It includes provisions to offset the cost of the bill without raising taxes or increasing the deficit. That's what we're bound to do by law. That's the law of the land. Nevertheless, four days later, the House Majority Leader, Mr. Gephardt, claimed in the House that he was introducing the President's program by request. That bill, H.R. 4210, was not the President's seven-point short-term economic stimulus package that he had asked to enact by March 20th. You all know it. And it certainly was not introduced by request of the President, as that term implies on the heading of the bill there, Mr. Chairman. Instead, it contained a modified version of the, all the tax provisions in that bill of the President, both short-term and long-term, but it did not contain any of the provisions to offset the costs. Now, that's not the President's bill. Notwithstanding this obvious misrepresentation of what the President had asked for, the Ways and Means Committee, and I have great respect for you, Mr. Chairman, uh, proceeded to schedule what can only be described as a kangaroo committee mock-up, not mark-up, mock-up session. I want it on TV. Uh, I watched it myself. And so did the American people. And the call-ins coming in from the American people were appalled at that hearing. During that brief mock-up, it reported H.R. 4210 without recommendation and without bothering to put forth the Democrat alternative for public scrutiny so, and, and debate. No debate was held on it. I watched every minute of it. The Democrats subsequently slammed the door in the face of the American people, including the Republican members of that committee, and certainly the press. You weren't there either. The bill, H.R. 4287, raises taxes. It raises the deficit. It breaks the agreement that we all swore to live by, Mr. Chairman. And ironically, it is a bill that the Democrats' own presidential frontrunner, Paul Songus, says he'll veto. And so does our frontrunner, the Republican frontrunner, Ronald, uh, yeah, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I'd never forget him. Mr. Chairman, those are the facts, plain and simple. It has not been a pretty process. It has not been a deliberative process. And it certainly has not been a democratic process. Now to top it all off, your Democrat leadership is asking this committee, and everybody should listen to this, your Democrat leadership is asking for a gag rule that only allows for two party substitutes without any amendment whatsoever, something this important, and without opportunity to forge any kind of a bipartisan compromise. That may be the Democrats' short-term political plan to prolong this recession. I hope not. But the American people do not want <clears throat> this kind of partisan gamesmanship. They want us to work together. And that's why we ought to put aside partisanship we can only do that in two ways. We can either send this bill back to your committee, Mr. Chairman Rostenkowski, or we can have an open rule and we can let 435 members of this House work its will. That's what we were sent here to do, not to be gagged, Democrats or Republicans alike, because that's what you're doing to members of your party, and you're certainly doing it to my party, and it's not right. I hope we can heed my advice and send this bill back to committee. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. If I might, just for the record, uh, submit the administration's strong opposition to the Democrat substitute, uh, which uh, basically says about the same thing I did, if I have enough Jackson. Thank you. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you publicly for scheduling this uh, hearing this morning promptly to deal with the middle income tax relief and economic growth uh, legislation. 
As we all know, the American people are looking to Congress for some relief for the situation that they now find themselves in with the uh, economy. And uh, I want to fur further thank you uh, for allowing many members of the Congress to come before. And we, when we report a rule out of here, I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but it is going to be broad-based. It's going to give the Republicans in the House an opportunity to present their views. We're going to have an opportunity to vote on the, uh, the President's plan, and we're also going to have an opportunity to vote on the Democratic alternative. To say that uh, there is some shenanigan going on uh, about the President's plan is absolutely absurd and ridiculous, and the American people know it. The President of the United States came before this body some time ago in his State of the Union address and presented a plan uh, to the country and to the Congress. And after he presented the plan, then he refused to introduce it into the Congress so we might vote on it and the American people might vote on it through their duly elected representatives. And the President refusing to do that and members of his party refusing to do that, we had to take the responsibility of introducing that plan so the people of this country could have an opportunity to, uh, to let their wishes be known through their elected uh, representatives. To say that there is some gag rule is absolutely uh, beyond, preposterous. Every view practically, and of, of the major uh, groups, that is, the Republicans in the House, the Republicans <coughs> and the Democrat, and the administration uh, will be allowed in whatever rule we pass, I am sure. So, Mr. Chairman, I want to say again how much I appreciate your expeditiously having this hearing so that the House uh, may move ahead with legislation that the American people need and want uh, uh, shortly so that we can come out of our economic morass that we find ourselves in at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's ironic that we're here again today. The fine programs that the President has presented over the years, the Democrats in the House have hammered away at them, destroyed them, and now they're blaming the President on the economic woes of the nation. Here's just another example of what's going on. I think it's very tragic and very critical that we have to face such a situation this week. Why not bring the President's program to the floor, let it be passed, because I believe he has the strength in that program for America to go forward even more so than it is today. This committee is faced with a decision today that we must not uh, forfeit our obligation. We know that the House is controlled considerably by the Democrats. You're going to do whatever you want to do. But I think the good judgment of this nation would be <coughs> that we let the pro a President's program survive and be presented as a package instead of piecemealing it so that the Republicans only have the opportunity of offering a substitute. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that ironic today that we're faced with that situation? I know Mr. Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He is sincere, but after all, I don't think he's getting his uh, the views or his views are being carried out in, in, in entirety because I think he's probably listening to instructions from other sources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Billinson. Want to speak for me? No. One later. <laughs> Mr. Dry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, extend my congratulations to you. Congratulations to you, Mr. Chairman, for creating what uh, Paul Songus very aptly described as a package which is designed to gain the votes as we look towards November. Obviously, that is an essential thing that does need to be done. But from my perspective, the real tragedy is that, that this package seems to be creating what the rest of the world is trying to get away from, and that is a class warfare, us versus them kind of strategy. We know 
that this package will create a dramatic tax increase which is permanent and uh, it will reward those in the so-called middle class with a temporary tax increase which is scheduled to expire next year after the election. So it seems to me that this is a, a very unfortunate thing to have us uh, develop here and I, I hope very much that we're able to come up with something fair. My friend uh, from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick, is not terribly sanguine about what kind of rule is going to be coming out of this committee. I suspect that I know what kind of rule will be coming out of this committee and I think it'll be uh, very unfortunate for the uh, American people. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Mr. Solomon, of course, is, uh, is my good friend, but uh, I just uh, have to take a little issue with him. You know, it's very interesting, Jerry. The, uh, these are two clear-cut approaches, and uh, that's what Congress is all about, uh, offering an alternative. Uh, the Democratic bill has a middle-class tax cut. The Republican bill does not have one, even though the President stood before us in the well of the House and said he wanted that. Uh, Mr. Archer will have the opportunity to offer his, uh, the Republican bill. Uh, the Chairman will carry the uh, committee bill, and there will be a, a decision made. I mean, that's what, that's what Congress is all about. I don't understand the, uh, my good friend's indignation because we will have two clear-cut approaches uh, before Congress, and we'll have a vote. McKeown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, or Mr. Chairman, I, too, am a little disappointed that the bill was not uh, given a little f greater consideration in committee and an opportunity for the President to present his alternatives. It seems to be uh, an effort to, uh, to create a confrontation, which I think many of us will not shy away from. It's interesting to note that Mexico recently went to a zero capital gains tax. Uh, Sweden, you noticed in adopting their budget, uh, reduced their tax on capital, which is the necessary ingredient to create jobs. In every Eastern European communist country, these trained Marxists, recognizing the need to stimulate their economy and allow <clears throat> free freedom and jobs to be created, have all gone to zero capital gains, just as all the major trading partners of the United States. And yet, uh, the United States continues to have the highest capital gains tax, the tax on capital formation necessary to create jobs of any nation in the industrialized world. I would hope that we could, cre we could correct that obviously dangerous mistake uh, that has entered the tax code in recent years and which we are now feeling the benefits on a daily basis. Yesterday, an additional 14,000 from General Motors. And I hope this would be the vehicle that would provide it and we would be given the opportunity to do it so that America may benefit and the politicians would, uh, would take a back seat to good government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bonya. Mr. Chairman, uh, this debate is uh, that we're about to engage in and that we will consume our attention over the next several days is, is basically about whose side are you on. The Democratic proposal provides jobs and tax relief for middle income people. It does so by, in an equitable way, asking those people at the top who have benefited so tremendously over the last 12 years in their taxes to help share in getting this country back on its feet. The Democratic proposal that we will be offering on the floor of the House will provide up to $800 per family in tax credits. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is an important piece of legislation for middle-income families. It is not insignificant amount of money for middle-income people. $800 per couple over the two-year period is a significant amount of money for many people in my congressional district and many people across this country. And it will be paid for by increasing the top rate, the marginal rate, on the wealthy, those who make a couple of $145,000 a year or more, imposing a millionaire surtax and capping the amount that corporations can write off from multi-million dollar pay packages to their top executives. It takes on the abuses at the corporate level in that particular area, and I think lends equity to the overall package. The second thing, besides equity and fairness that this bill does, is that it promotes economic growth and job creation. Our package adopts the best features um, uh, of, of, the, of some of the proposals that the President has suggested, including the investment tax allowance. Then we target capital gains on new venture capital and small businesses to create jobs. And of course, on indexing, which is a, 
fair way to go on the, on the capital gains issue. We also provide new growth ideas focused on jobs and long-term growth, increase the amount of expensing for small business, and make R&D credit permanent. There is also an extension, I believe, in the proposal that we have uh, for targeted jobs tax credit for certain individuals in our economy. And thirdly, the deficit reduction argument in this important argument. Over the budget window of 1992 to 97, our budget, our package more than pays for itself, setting aside over $13 billion for deficit reduction. Now, the Republican proposal, as several have indicated already this morning, is really bait and switch. In his State of the Union address, the President said we should increase the personal exemption for each child right now. Then he dropped it and all his other middle-income tax relief proposals in favor of a fast action on capital gains and corporate tax breaks. A writer in the Washington Post uh, quotes one congressional Republican as saying, quote, the White House really never wanted anything but the narrow package. The President outlined the broader one to have something for the middle class and others to compete with the Democratic rhetorically. They needed a campaign speech. And as we've seen over the last several weeks, Mr. Buchanan has taken the President and the Republican Party that supports his proposal to task for jerking the middle income tax relief proposal that the President spoke to the country about out of the package. In terms of their method of financing, the Republican package relies on accounting gimmicks and real pain. Accrual accounting merely wishes away deficits by taking credit now for savings that may occur later. CBO in two letters uh, debunks these proposals. The main source of real savings comes from a provision that disallows dying civil service employees their current right to withdraw in lump sum their own retirement contribution. Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the Secretary of Housing, Mr. Kemp, has referred to this financing publicly as recently as three weeks ago as gimmickry. <laughs> and the question of who benefits, if you look at the Republican proposal, it clearly benefits the rich. The heart of the Republican package is their version of capital gains. Lower and middle income families would earn less than 10% of the tax benefits. People who make more than $100,000 a year, less than 3.5% of the taxpayers would get about 80% of the benefits. So I think it's very clear, Mr. Chairman, what this is all about. It's whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the people that have been squeezed during this recession, squeezed by health care costs, squeezed by job loss, squeezed by this recession that's eaten away at any disposable income they might have to put aside for their kids' college education or pay health care bills? Or are you on the side of those who have really gained the bounty of the last dozen years, the wealthy? Uh, it's, it's a very clear distinction, this bill and this debate will create for us on the House floor when we, when we debate it this week. And I hope my colleagues uh, will understand that distinction. I believe they do. And I hope for the sake of the uh, American people and the hard-squeezed middle class that we will pass the Democratic proposal forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Boyner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, the President uh, challenged the Congress to produce a vehicle by a certain time in March. And the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee produced it, along with his members, and we have many issues before us that we'll be voting on it. Personally, I, I, I will be looking at how, this, how these proposals affect the deficit. I understand through many documents that the President's original, um, original proposal would add to the deficit something like $52 billion. And uh, this is our system. He's going to get a chance for the vote. Appreciate the chairman uh, working on this and bringing this before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when the president originally challenged us to, by March 20th, produce a bill that could be passed, there were those who suggested that it was a cynical and crass political maneuver because it was not likely that the Congress could give adequate attention to tax bills in that short a time span. I prefer to think of it as a sincere uh, attempt to do something for the American economy. And the Congress has responded with a sincere attempt uh, to produce uh, tax bills that we can consider. Uh, it's obvious that there's a different philosophical view between the Democratic Party. Uh, the, perhaps the Democratic bill isn't one that any of us individually would have written. But it is a consensus of Democratic Party views. It does uh, promote middle class tax relief. And I think that's the essence of our program. I will be interested to hear what the Republican uh, bill is. I'm, I will admit to some confusion at this point 
as to what the President wants to do or what he doesn't want to do, in as much as he has changed his proposal since the State of the Union message. But I, for one, am willing to put the President's bill on the floor to let it be judged on its merits or lack thereof. And I hope that the other party will certainly give uh, our bill the same consideration. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, people in Tennessee are hurting. And I know that you know that your folks in Massachusetts are hurting now, as they are hurting across the country. This is a result of several months of a recessionary economy in this country. And we've got to act uh, to move this country forward. I think that last year Congress uh, took a, a strong step forward in passing the transportation bill that's going to kick in this year, uh, creating uh, 600,000 jobs and helping make our country um, uh, be able to address those needs in, in our infrastructure. And now we've got to move forward with some, with some stimulus to the economy uh, this year. And in doing so, I think that we have to look, at least in my mind, at a, at a, at a, a bill that will be revenue neutral at, at best, or at worst, really, hopefully, uh, as in the Democratic plan, it will even reduce the deficit in the future. I think we've got to look at a plan that will help create jobs, and I think we've got to, to do something uh, immediately. And I'm pleased that, uh, with your leadership, that we're able to get this bill on the floor so that we can quickly act. And I think we're also going to uh, stop a trend that I've seen over the last 10 years, uh, and that is a trend toward putting a greater portion of the burden of government on the middle class. It's time that that change, and this bill uh, that the Democratic Caucus has come up with will start to make that change and move that burden from the middle class. And so I'm pleased that we're acting. We're acting uh, quickly, and, and I appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to be very brief because I know we've got a long morning ahead of us. I just want to say that on behalf of the 75,000 people who got the bad news yesterday and are now added to the unemployment rolls in addition to the numbers of Americans already who are out of work and desperately looking for it, um, I want to give them some hope that in this bill we are really doing something to create jobs. I think that's what pleases me most about it. What we're doing for small business, for manufacturing, for agriculture is important. And it really says that in this Congress we're deciding that it's time to take care of our own. And that is a, a very important, no small item that I don't want the American people to, to miss in this debate. And I'm very anxious to get on with it. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, feel free to go off your prepared speech or uh, to my, uh, answer any of the questions yes, that sir. may have been. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, my, my, my statement is not uh, a lengthy one. It gives you the flavor of just what's happened with the, with the respect to the creation of the legislation. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I come uh, before you today to request that the Rules Committee grant a modified closed rule for consideration of H.R. 4210 that would allow two hours of general debate to be equally divided, two substitutes which <coughs> would not be subject to amendment, with one hour of debate on each proposed substitute to be equally divided. One substitute would be the text of 4200 if offered by Mr. Michael or his designee. The other substitute would be the text of 4287 the alternative crafted by the Democratic members on the Committee on Ways and Means to be offered by myself or by designee. On February 24th, Mr. Chairman, the Committee on Ways and Means reported H.R. 4210 to the House without amendment and without recommendation. As you know, H.R. 4210 represents the tax provisions that the President submitted in his fiscal year 1993 budget. The Republican members of the committee have asked that they be allowed to offer a substitute for the president's original proposal. That substitute is embodied in H.R. 4200. It includes seven of the tax provisions originally proposed by the president and several provisions within the jurisdiction of other committees of the House. The Ways and Means Committee asks that you allow H.R. 4200 to be offered as a substitute for 4210. The Democratic members of the Committee on Ways and Means have also crafted a substitute for 4210. Our substitute would provide a balanced package of middle class tax relief, economic growth incentives, and long term deficit reduction. Also, it would make the tax code fairer by requiring, requiring the wealthy to pay their fair share. Our substitute includes 
the two-year refundable income tax credit of up to $400 for Social Security taxes that the Majority Leader and I have introduced last year. This tax credit would provide broad relief, helping more than 90 million households and 80 percent of all taxpayers. Our substitute improves tax fairness by adding a 35 percent tax rate for high-income taxpayers and a 1 percent point increase in their minimum tax. It also would extend for two years the phase out of the personal exemption and itemized deductions for high income individuals enacted in 1990. In addition, the substitute requires millionaires to pay a surtax on that portion of their income over $1 million. It also would limit at $1 million a year the deductions a corporation can take for executive compensation. Since it is vital, of, of vital importance to provide incentives for growth, our substitute provides the same accelerated depreciation benefits and minimum tax relief as the President's Bush proposal and adds additional write-offs specifically targeted to small business. The substitute indexes capital gains so that investors will not pay on tax on inflation and provides important tax targeted incentives for venture capital investments. The real estate passive loss rules would be liberalized to help the ailing real estate industry. The substitute would also permanently extend many important expiring tax provisions, such as the R&D credit, mortgage revenue bonds, the low income housing credit, the exclusion for educational assistance, and the targeted jobs credit. In addition, Mr. Chairman, to these provisions, the substitute would provide important simplification of tax laws. Through fiscal year 1997, the substitute would reduce the deficit by more than $14 billion. While it more than com complies with the spirit of the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, it does provide a modest amount of economic stimulus in the first two years, more than offset by revenue increases over the next four years. Consequently, the substitute contains a provision directing that the early revenue shortfall not cause sequestration of mandatory spending programs and that the later surplus not be available for additional spending. This revenue will be used only for deficit reduction. Mr. Chairman, I believe the Democratic substitute represents a well-balanced package and ask, and ask you to make it an order on the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like, if I may be permitted, uh, to clarify some of the comments that have been made here with respect to our substitute, uh, the Archer Michael substitute, and the President's proposal. <clears throat> Various members of the administration that, uh, who, who have either written me or testified before our committee have suggested, and I quote, uh, on February 7th, the director of OMB, Dick Darman, wrote me, the chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, and stated, H.R. 4200 is, of course, thoroughly consistent with the President's program. For all these reasons, therefore, we urge it prompt enactment. On February 11, 1992, Secretary Treasury Nick Brady wrote me, H.R. 4200 contains those specific economic growth proposals that the President asked the Congress to be enacted by March 20th. The administration strongly supports H.R. 4200 and believes that prompt enactment would provide a much needed boost to the economy as well as to those Americans out of work or concerned about their future employment. Uh, the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy, uh, Mr. Goldberg, on February 12th stated before the Committee on Ways and Means, H.R. 4200 reflects the bill the President of the United States would like to see on his desk by March 20th. The President would like to see H.R. 4200 enacted by March 20th. This is the bill we are requesting. This is the bill we are prepared to sign. Now, to, to clarify actually what has happened, uh, we had suggested uh, that the administration introduce the President's entire piece of legislation. It was, in their opinion, uh, 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 the fact that they didn't want to pursue all three titles of the bill. They wanted to pursue only one title of the bill. Now, that's a revision. And it's true. Uh, one of our colleagues has pointed out that the President laid down the gauntlet. The President gave us the time frame. And it was with these conditions in mind that we tried as quickly as possible to formulate legislation 
uh, that would uh, that would stimulate the economy and bring tax fairness uh, into uh, into the structured tax code. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we had nothing to do with the creation of the president's program. We had nothing. Democrats on the committee had nothing to do with H.R. 4200, which was introduced by Mr. Archer. Therefore, I look, why are we criticized when we pass their legislation out without recommendation and we, Democrats, sit back and create a piece of legislation that, in my opinion, is better crafted, reaches more people, helps more middle-income uh, taxpayers, but be, to be criticized. Now, it wasn't just a creature of, uh, uh, of the members of the Democratic uh, Party on the Ways and Means Committee. We, in turn, went to the, to the committee, to, to the caucus, and had over 200 members participate on two occasions in the crafting of this legislation. This, uh, sir, is a, is, is a structure of more than half of the members of the Congress of the United States. I, I, I resent the fact that uh, this administration is criticizing us for having gone into a hole like weasels and crafted a structure, which I think is, uh, is possibly going to get enough members on the floor of the House of Representatives to support. Now, I didn't suggest uh, to this administration that we do it by March 20th. I, I, don't, I don't argue with the fact that we should move with, it, with, with as much haste as possible. But let's be prudent about what we do. And so uh, uh, if, if, if there was anybody that was suggesting that we do it piecemeal, it's certainly not the Democrats. The Democrats want to craft legislation and send it to the floor. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I'll conclude with this. Debate is what legislating is all about. We have a different view than Mr. Solomon and the Republicans. I mean, we want to take care of the middle class and bring fairness into the code. I think in the theater that's called politics, uh, Mr. Bush found out in New Hampshire that he couldn't neglect the middle class, or at least another gentleman that's running for for president in that, uh, Buchanan? Buchanan pointed that out. When Mr. Bonner was just siding with it. <clears throat> I'm just suggesting <clears throat> that um, the president wants us to move as swiftly as possible. I think we're trying to accommodate the president. But I recognize the old legal adage, if you haven't got the facts, pound the table. And that is what I'm afraid uh, is happening here. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have no objection to, uh, to the minority offering the president's proposal, and I think a full debate on the floor of the House will, uh, will educate the American people, and we'll have, uh, we'll have a, uh, a conclusion as to uh, just how quickly we want to pass the bill and what we want to see in it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let me just say to my good friend Dan Roskinkowski, who, along with you, are probably two of the most respected members of the House, and we feel that on our side of the aisle. Uh, but, Danny, you know, um, we don't think that you're weasels hiding in a hole. We, Somebody uh, in the administration uh, called us that. Uh, you're aware of that. I think you? you're more like foxes, uh, you know, uh, getting into the hen house, only instead of the hen house, you're, you're getting into the American people's pocket. Dan, let me, let me just... Uh, quote you in an article in the, House, uh, in the New York Times, it says, the House tactician of taxation, you know, and they go on and they flatter you and they say, Dan Rostenkowski will be leading the fight for the Democrat middle class tax cut in the House this week, but that does not mean he expects it to become law. And then they go on to say, concerning the bill's appeal, Mr. Rostenkowski discusses that exclusively in terms political rather than substantive. He frequently repeats that the economist his committee heard in December advised inaction, but says, the one time I agree with the economist, I'm forced to do something other than sit on my fanny and do nothing. Now, Danny, you, you really- Can I answer that? Sure, I've been glad to yield um, I don't think uh, in taking testimony in any congressional hearing, uh, the members that are gathering the testimony aren't influenced by the people that are giving the testimony. 
And you couldn't sit and, and listen to all the testimony and not be influenced by what the economists were saying. I wanted to point out, too, Mr. Sure. Holmes, sometimes the economists are wrong. Mm. Uh, but but, but this, this is the time uh, when, when the administration started as early as November telling us that the president in the State of the Union message was going to have a proposal uh, that was going to be the answers to all the questions that we were raising. Uh, there's an honest difference as to whether or not the Republicans' recommendations with respect to the legislation is acceptable to, to Democrats. But uh, uh, you know as well as I do, uh, you're going to see a program uh, that is demanded by a majority of the membership of the House of Representatives. I think the, uh, I, I think the minority was in the well quite frequently suggesting that we have a program, a package. Well, we've put together a package just because it isn't exclusively what Mr. Gingrich and what Mr. Solomon wanted. It doesn't mean that it's a bad package. Well, Dan, you know, much of what you, so what you say makes sense. But, you know, there are 167 Republicans on this side of the aisle. We're outnumbered by 101, I think it is. And uh, that's tough enough to fight and fight Is that because we work fair. harder in our districts or what? It sure idiot. does. But, uh, you know, uh, Lee Hamilton, one of the other most respected members of your house, and myself and others, are really trying to put together some congressional reform to try to stop what is happening here today. And, you know, you're putting out this, this rule, and I have your letter here of your request to myself and, and Mr. Moakley, and you, you're gagging us, and you're gagging some members on their side. Wait a minute now. For instance, you know, I have been one of the strongest supporters, which Mr. Michael knows and Mr. Archer on our side, of a millionaire's tax. I think it ought to be over $500,000, not a million. And I'd like to be able to work with that on the floor of the House. Uh, I don't like your taxing, raising the taxes of people with incomes over $85,000. Uh, that to me is wrong. So how can we work our will and come up with a bipartisan bill that we could, that we could, that we could get to the president? Well, we just can't do it under this. You're saying let's give the president his chance and let's give the Democrats, but never mind the Republicans. And Danny, well, that, that's wrong. And that, you know is not, that is not what I'm saying. The administration and many members in the legislative process have suggested that 4,200 is, is what the administration and what the minority wants. All I'm saying is that if you're going to lay down a March 20th deadline, the Ways and Means Committee has to move quite swiftly in order to get a bill out of the House of Representatives and sent over to the other body. Now, Lord knows how long it's going to take them to come up with a bill. But I think that we should fulfill the responsibilities and the challenge that the president has offered us. Now, because we have a difference of opinion, the best way to, you know, the best way, in my opinion, to, to try to solve our problem is put these two items on the floor of the House of Representatives, or the three, and see whether or not we have a majority. If we have a majority, if, if, if 4,200 wins, well and good. I'll go to conference and I'll protect 4,200. Uh, However, if, if the bill that the Democratic caucus has put together is, is I'll go to the caucus and protect it against uh, what, what the um, Senate wants to do. And I'm not always impressed with what they want to do. Danny, you're tough. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, one of the greatest disappointments probably in the House of Representatives <clears throat> to me personally is whenever there's a crisis we march up and down the aisle as Democrats or Republicans. It seems to me in the crisis we're in today that we all get together and march up and down the aisle as Americans and do whatever is necessary to cure the problems of this nation. Look what your deficit is. Look what the Democrats have done to this nation. And we might uh, smile at that statement. No, sir, I'm not smiling at all. I but that, but nevertheless, the deficit keeps going up. The President of the United States cannot spend any money that isn't appropriated. And who has control of the House of Representatives and the Senate of the United States? It's time that we forget partisan politics and do whatever is necessary, the good for this nation of ours. And I believe that, Danny. Well, and I, and and I, I know, know you... that you would march with us. I'm not being critical to you personally, well, but as a body controlled as the House is by the Democrats, I think the American people will realize what's going on, and we should change that. Well, Jim, let, let me just 
<clears throat> say honestly, uh, I think we fail to realize that for six years the Republicans controlled the Senate as well. I mean, so we were very much a minority in the House of Representatives. Uh, but, uh, but, but the 81 tax bill uh, is probably, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, the greatest contributor to this runaway deficit uh, that we've ever passed in the House of Representatives. And, and since the enactment of the 81, the 81 tax bill, we have consistently been go going back to raise revenue so that we could put money back into the Treasury. Now, you know, that was the will of the people. And, and you know, I, I think truly that this House represents, generally speaking, what the will of the people is. And, I, and I'd be the first one to admit that the people are giving us mixed signals. And so therefore, I, I, don't, I, I don't frown on debate. I think the only way we're going to get the American people's attention is to have the debate and let them, starting to, let them start knowing about how they want us to decide these issues. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> That's okay, Mr. Chairman. I really wasn't going to say anything, but my friend from Tennessee inspired me to. It, it's, it's discouraging <coughs> to hear the kind of some of the discussion that we're having here today. Uh, you know, obviously it's political to a great extent. We understand that. But for somebody to say that uh, because the Democrats have had the majority in Congress the last 10 or 12 years or most of the Congress, that's what's gotten us into this situation is just beyond belief. And what's even more beyond belief is that some of our colleagues over there really don't understand the, the true reason for all of this. In, in fact, as the gentleman should recall, Republican presidents, Republican presidents have each year submitted budgets which were billion, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, out of balance. Mr. Mr. Reagan, Mr. Bush now has been submitting to us each year, each year, a budget which is many hundreds of billions of dollars out of balance. Every single year since Mr. Reagan was president, the Democratic controlled appropriations process in this Congress has appropriated less money than the Republican president has asked us to appropriate. Mr. Rosenkowski is exactly correct. The heart of the problem, of the, of the deficit problem which we're confronted with was the 1981 tax cut, which even, even with subsequent tax increases, 1986 and other in 1984, I guess it was too, still is responsible for somewhere between 70 and 85 percent of our annual deficit. If we, had, if we were still taxing ourselves at the rate we were taxing ourselves back in 1980, 1979, we'd have close to $300 billion in additional revenues this year. Now, everybody was responsible, unfortunately, for that tax cut. A lot of Democrats supported it. But uh, it, was, it was sponsored by Mr. by Mr. Reagan, and we were trying to keep up with him, and it was a tragic mistake on, on both sides. But that's the reason we find ourselves in this in this situation. It isn't, uh, it isn't just the Democrats' fault, and the gentleman from Tennessee certainly should, should know that by now. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, too, I think, that we're, that we're stuck in the situation we are, we are here today. Uh, we're, we're trying to solve a, a problem with respect to the recession, uh, and at the same time, seeking not to make things worse over the, over the long run. And unfortunately, what you do for one is of necessity something which hurts the chances uh, for, the, for the long run. As, as our other friend from Tennessee, Mr. Gordon, suggested earlier quite correctly, people out there are hurting. But the people out there are not stupid. And I think that what people want these days is not the kind of tax package that either party is offering us. They're not, they don't want modest-sized tax cuts. Uh, I think they want reduction in the deficit. I think they want long-term investment uh, with the, with the uh, idea that we'll have better productivity and uh, and better jobs, paying, paying higher, higher wages, because pe people's real wages have gone down these last few years. And uh, frankly, I think it's foolish for us to be, in a sense, uh, throwing away 40-some billion dollars over a two-year period to give a very modest, and I hope my friends on, on my left over here on the Democratic side will forgive me, but it's not all that, you know, it isn't all that amount of money. I'd rather take those $40 billion and invest them in new jobs. That's what the people in my district want. They want jobs. They want investment in the economy. They want the deficit brought down rather than a, a modest uh, tax break. And don't, don't smile over there because they certainly don't want what you guys want, which are tax breaks for the wealthy, thinking that somehow that will eventually help regular, you know, regular middle class people in, in the country. That, if, if one has to choose between these two, tax, uh, these two tax bills, quite obviously, in my opinion, the Democratic one is far preferable. But ne neither one is the, is the road that we should be going down, in my opinion. 
I think we should tax the wealthy people in this country who have, as our friend Mr. Bonnier pointed out quite correctly, done enormously well over the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, they're, they're paying about a third less in taxes now than they were then. Their incomes have more than doubled over the last 10 years. We should be taxing them, raising their taxes, and investing all of that money into creating jobs for everybody else and to getting the economy going instead of piddling it away by giving back a relatively insignificant tax cut. And we're also, of course, facing our forcing ourselves to face the situation where, where this uh, middle class tax cut the Democrats, my friends over here, are, are, are suggesting is going to expire two years from now in the next, in the, right in the middle of the, of the, or toward the end of the next uh, election year. And we're going to be forced with a, with a problem then of whether or not we're going to extend this thing, thereby increasing the deficit by $75 billion over the subsequent three years or letting it expire in the middle of an election year. So we're putting ourselves in a difficult situation there, too. But I don't want any of my friends over here to my right, who, and they are our good friends, to, to smile at anything I'm saying or, or encourage me on, because as I suggested, your alternative, in my opinion, is far worse than ours. But it's, just, it's, it's a shame that we're not taking the advice of the economists, which basically is to do nothing, to do nothing in terms of changing the tax law, uh, start investing some money in the future of this country, in the long-term, long-term interest of the economy and let this recession uh, start, start ending, as I think it probably is right now, although the government should be, should be, should be contributing toward, toward the kinds of things I was suggesting. But I, I'm afraid that we're, that we're being forced by politics on both sides to do something which is, not, which is not good for the country over the long term, and I'm sorry to see that happen. Would my friend from California yield since you've mentioned my name? Surely. I believe I heard you say that that uh, the Republicans had control of the House in the last 10 or 12 years. My memory tells me that we have not had control of the House of Representatives in the last 50 years. I, I, I'm sorry if I misspoke. I thought I, was, I thought I said that the Republicans had a president for the past 12 or 13 years and that that Republican president each year has submitted to the House and to the Senate a budget which was totally out of balance by hundreds of billions of dollars. I, and that the House and the Senate, in fact, appropriated less money even than the Republican president in all of cases has asked us to appropriate. So I have ever respect for my friend from California. Uh, if I misinterpreted that, I... Uh, Apologize, but I think you did say 10 or 12 years. Perhaps you were alluding to the fact that the Senate was controlled by Republicans for two terms. Be that as it may, I think this clearly demonstrates my <coughs> opening remarks when I said that we should march up the aisle as Americans instead of partisans. If we did that, we cure the ills of this nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If the American people uh, don't want partisan bickering. They uh, seem to be getting something more than they had wanted from uh, the Rules Committee, and I suspect it was the same in the Ways and Means Committee, and I suspect it will be the same when we finally get to the floor with this. And uh, it is unfortunate. My, uh, my good friend from California, Mr. Bielenson, and I obviously disagree, and I think that uh, as, as these figures are thrown around, I'd like to point to uh, your Green Book, the Ways and Means Committee um, uh, volume, which um, the 1991 Green Book, which uh, talks about a wide range of issues. And one of the things that it says that in, in 1977, the year generally chosen by Democrats as a basis of comparison, the top 20 percent of families paid 67.8 percent of all income taxes. The bottom 20 percent of families paid less than minus three-tenths of a percent of all income taxes. In other words, they actually got money back from the government largely as a result of the refundable earned income tax credit. By comparison, in 1992, the top 20 percent of families are projected to pay 75 percent of all income taxes, while the bottom 20 percent pay uh, minus nine-tenths of a percent of all income taxes. So it seems to me that the figures that we've just heard are a little off. And I, as I, as I listen to Mr. Bonnier, you or, that they're, they're not off, off, Dave. They're not off. off because you, what you, what you specifically didn't do is mention the payroll tax, and that's where the whole tax system is Why skewed against middle-income people. You're, you're yeah. quoting your if, report. If, if I may, to my good friend, you can look at these things in different ways, and it may well be that a larger fraction of the total taxes are paid by the top fifth or the top whatever. It's also true. What I said was also true that the average wealthy person in this country's income has more than doubled over the 
last 10 years and that their taxes per person have been decreased by one third. That's not of true. course, they've got a lot more that's income and therefore a lot more, you know, their income is more than doubled. And of course, that's why they're paying perhaps a larger fraction of the, of the overall income tax. You know, in my opening statement, the point that I was trying to make that is very frustrating for me is this perpetuation of class warfare and this us versus them mentality, which continues to be so pervasive. And I think it's a real tragedy that we have to uh, continue to try and do this. And as I was also saying, uh, this package imposes a permanent tax increase and provides tax relief really as we look towards the November election. I think that's, that's a, a very sad thing. And I'd like to say, uh, we're not asking you a lot of questions here, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to say in, in response to the, the opening statement by the distinguished uh, majority whip as far as job creation, it seems to me that as, as we look at this package that has, has come forward, it doesn't seem to create an awful lot of jobs, that being the Democratic package. And I'd, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we, we had those 25 economists who said maybe we should do nothing. And I suspect that when they wanted us to do nothing, they weren't talking about a capital gains differential. They were probably talking about the middle income uh, tax cut, which most people and, and uh, leaders in the presidential campaign have indicated are not going to play a role in creating jobs. So this is called an economic growth job creation package. What is the projected increase in the gross national product and employment that we're going to be seeing from the Democrat package if it were to become public law? Well, you, you've alluded to the fact that the, the economists have suggested that we do nothing. They were as critical of capital gains as they were of anything else. They, in most instances, they just said sit on your hands and do nothing. Uh, the, the, the criticism was that whatever you're going to do, you're going to make, an, make the American people apprehensive, uh, disillusioned, and you might increase the deficit. And that is, that is one of the reasons why I, uh, I am pleased to, have, to see that uh, with respect to the deficit, we're trying at least uh, to, to recognize the problem in the deficit. But uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist and I can't give you a projection as to just what, what, what the outcome of this bill will be, just like I couldn't tell you about the 81 tax bill, mm -hmm. except I was a little better on my predictions then than, I, than I'd be now. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, confused about this because most of the economists that I saw, and we don't have Mr. Mr. Archer up here yet, but it seemed to me that most of them seemed to support that differential in capital gains. Uh, you know, and, and as we look at, uh, as Mr. McEwen was saying earlier, if you look at the uh, developing uh, nations, clearly they are looking towards uh, a reduced capital gains uh, tax as a way in which we're going to create uh, growth. And I, as I well, read a lot of them, well, I don't, you I mean, know, so you're saying I'm, that I'm just not going to identify, the capital gains I can remember, they were the middle income no, I can bill. remember several uh, economists that identified the fact that we shouldn't do anything. Uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to identify, uh, I mean, I'll be glad to send you the, the excerpts of the testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, 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 ent the entire gamut, and, uh, and I remember the old Truman story, you know, give me a one-armed economist because I don't want any of this. On the one hand, you'll get this, and on the <laughs> other hand, you'll get that. But uh, as I pointed out uh, uh, to Mr. Solomon, uh, you, you, you cannot ignore what, the testimony is if you're sitting there uh, over a period of uh, 52 hours listening to testimony uh, and yet recognize that this is politics mm -hmm. and that something is going mm -hmm. to happen. And, uh, you know, I might uh, ju just suggest that if Mr. Moakley, uh, I'm sure, uh, doesn't express the will of not only his membership but of the caucus as well. Mr. Moakley may not be chairman of the Committee on Rules, as I would not be the chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's certainly different views. I mean, we come from a, from a, a, a solemn feeling that, uh, that we want to do something for the middle class, that we think that there's an inequity, and we're going to give you an opportunity to make a choice, as you are giving us an opportunity to, in, in 4200 to make a choice. And I don't like... I, I'm not encouraging political rhetoric, and I'm not. I'm. I'm running in a campaign myself. We don't need your encouragement. We do it well enough without. <laughs> but 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 I, I I just I I agree that uh, that you know that, that there's a great deal of confusion out there and frustration, and I don't know uh, until we get something direct uh, like I think is developing in a health policy for this country, uh, we're, we're we're going to. Make choices. Can I ask one question about a specific item that, that uh, concerns me? We, 
have all witnessed the HUD scandals that have gone on over the past several years. And one item that is in your package is the establishment of an enterprise zone czar. Uh, and it would seem to me that with the problems that we've had in the area of, um, of uh, you know, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and, and all, that probably the best route for us to take would be to create a zero capital gains tax in enterprise zones is a way by which we could encourage the kind of development which would be beneficial. Why wasn't that uh, option incorporated? Well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the enterprise zone initiative is a priority of this administration mm -hmm. uh, that has been on my desk for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, many members of the committee, not, not exclusively on my side of the aisle, have been have been suggesting that we include this in the bill. It's, it's experimental, but if you're talking about the czar, I, th I, I believe that you're referring to the local official that sits there and, mm -hmm. and makes the judgment. I, 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 just, I just don't know, you know how, other than, than having somebody in a locality uh, make the decisions uh, that, that are maybe different in, in Philadelphia as they are in Los Angeles. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Right. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, would you uh, give a little information about how the uh, investment incentives work, uh, specifically, uh, not, it wasn't a full ITC, it was something short of that that was put in the bill. Actually, uh, the, the attractiveness was the, the depreciation factor in the first year, and that, that is the attraction, actually, for, uh, for investment. It's it's a 15 percent reduction in uh, in de depreciation. It's a bonus depreciation. Yes. For the first year. And does that apply to everybody? Yes, sir. How does how does that differ from uh, what we had in law prior to '86 with the investment tax credit? Actually, uh, Mr. Frost, I, I, you can convert this. You got the option? I'm told that it's similar to an investment tax credit, but it's at a, at a lower rate. Let me give you an idea, uh, Mr. Frost, as to why um, we, we, we become very hesitant about credits in the investment tax area. They're extremely expensive. Uh, and you don't know whether or not when you rifle shoot for a particular area, uh, whether you're accomplishing your goal. Uh, if I can give you an idea of how expensive investment, <laughs> investment tax credits are, in the 86 Act, we lowered the 42% the cor capital uh, uh, corporate rate to 34%. And that was paid for exclusively by investment tax credit. That's, that, that's, that's how expensive it is, and yet you don't know whether you're getting the best bang for your buck. The reason I ask you is that there was, in, in my part of the country, there was a substantial amount of support for something like the well, this, investment tax credit that we used this to This, Mr. Frost, is, is, is exactly what the President has in his bill as well. It's, it, it's, it's exactly the same. So he did not call for a full restoration of the old investment tax no. credit. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, if, if you could help me, you made mention in your testimony that we want to make the people that are pursuing the American dream uh, pay more of their fair share. Uh, that's, uh, I want to get a handle on that a little better if I can. Let's take the top 10 percent of the income earners in America. What percentage of the total overall burden of government should that top 10 percent carry under your definition of fairness? Are you, are, you, are you asking me what percent? Yes. Our proposal tax is, I think, the, 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 the top 1%. Uh, 
I don't know what. I, I don't know that I can give you a a percentage and, until I look at what the effect, the rate increase would be on what level of dollars of income. I'd have to. I'd have to look at that. I mean the. The attractiveness here naturally is uh, is what Mr. Dreyer finds uh, somewhat uh, unfair that we we don't tax anybody until they're the single income of eighty five thousand dollars, and it's a hundred that's taxable income up to one hundred and forty five thousand dollars for a married couple. It, that's uh, that's something that uh, when you're when you're making a decision, you're trying to find out where the middle income group is and what is it that you feel that you can raise in revenues to distribute to a lower income people? Well, if I could use uh, the Joint Economic Committee, the top 1% in America in 1981 paid 18% of the taxes, the federal income taxes, paid 18% in 1981. In 1988, they paid 28%, or rather significant, some might say massive, increase in the burden that they're carrying. Regardless of the political rhetoric, breaks for the rich, nobody's paying, little guy carrying the bill. Well, Mr. McEwen, if they're paying more, it's because they became wealthier, as was pointed out here by, uh, by Mr. Bonney. So then it gets down to what this is all about. The question is not whether or not they're carrying their load for America. The question is whether or not we really deep down inside have a contempt for people that pursue the American Green well, I don't and think that's true at all. Uh, you know, I, I sat alongside at a dinner party with Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan suggested that uh, when he was in films and he was an outstanding movie actor, he made 90, he was paying 91 uh, percent in, in a top marginal rate. Uh, and it was his dream, naturally, to get us down to 35 percent. I don't know whether you gentlemen were around then, but that was the dream of the President of the United States. Uh, Actually, when I took over the chairmanship of the Ways and Means Committee in 1980, I went to Chicago and made the first uh, Democratic statement about lowering the rates from 70, which is where they were, to 50 percent. And that was very attractive, because I thought at the time we could stir in investment. Well, when the bill left the House of Representatives, uh, the top rate, marginal rate, was at 38 uh, percent. When it got to the Senate, uh, the, the, I guess the, uh, the real estate lobbies were so comfortable that they didn't realize what Senator Packwood was going to do to them. President Reagan, who was paying 91 percent when he was in films, uh, was more attractive to a 28 percent rate and therefore the reduction uh, of the rate to 28 percent. How do we pay for that? Uh, we paid for that uh, by eliminating all the, all the uh, provisions in the real estate area uh, that gave us the revenue for that. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that uh, sure. that I'd be I'd be very very willing if I were a millionaire to pay a to Fine. pay a certain Fine. tax. But let, let me let's just focus on the point. The point is in tax policy should be to increase revenues to the government. It should not be to penalize or destroy people from being successful. So therefore, if under tax policy, it increases revenues to the government. We should not have our contempt or greed so spurious as to deny them the chance to succeed. Now, what I has happened? I don't what think we do that, Mr. McEwen. All we say is when you succeed, you're going to pay a little more. That's exactly, all. Mr. Chairman. And, 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 and exactly. I, I, think, I think in most, in most instances, Mr. McEwen, people that I will talk with at dinner parties will be suggesting Danny, you're to me, you know, we me. should now, really be paying more. Twi twice now you stopped me in mid-sentence. Here's sorry. the point. I'm sorry. I have no quarrel with you. You are absolutely right. In the 1970s, when if you risked capital and you lost it, you were out of luck. And if you won, the government took it. People did not invest. They sat on their yachts. The capital markets were down. And the stock market was at 700%. When you, Mr. Chairman, passed legislation that lowered the tax rate, which said this, that if you risk and you lose, you're out of luck. But if you win, you get to keep nearly three out of every four dollars. And suddenly the money came out of the land, which was at 3,000 an acre and dropped to 12, out of gold, which was at 800 and dropped to 300, out of the hiding places of porcelain and diamonds and, and floated back into the capital and financial markets. The stock market went from 700 in 1981 
I was sitting with Ronald Reagan in 1982 when a fellow came in and slipped him a piece of paper. He looked down at it and he said, the stock market just broke a thousand. You know what it is now? Over three and a half times that. A massive 500% increase in the total capital worth of America. Now, what happens when that happens? People pay more taxes. And the percentage of taxes that are being paid by the top 1% went from 18% to 28%, or nearly a third, by the top 1%. And yet you have just heard already this morning the contempt for those people, not because they're not carrying their burden, they're carrying a greater burden. Not because they're not contributing, they are contributing. Not because they're creating jobs, they are creating jobs. But because, dag nabbit, they got money left. But and if the they deficit. got money left, government ought to get in there and take it away from them. And what we have said is that we have learned time after time after time that when you increase the taxes on savings and investment, they don't do it. The economy goes down, you have less jobs, and you have less revenues and a bigger deficit. And how many thousand times must we go through this cycle before we learn that denying people the chance to, ha to succeed in the American dream does not help the deficit or government either one? Well, Mr. McEwen, all I know is that the state of the economy after the 81 tax bill. Uh, shut up. It, it, shut up. Yeah, but, but, the, shut but the deficit up. shot up as well. And under the provisions of this legislation, uh, if my numbers are correct, uh, those making a profit get to keep 60 percent. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Chairman, now listen to this. Don't, don't you really feel that if you, if you can fairly distribute earnings and, and, and the tax schedule to middle income, that that in itself is going to create an activity in the economy that will even give an opportunity for the wealthier to get wealthier. Point number two, you cannot sit here and tell members of Congress that know better that the reason that the deficit went up in the 1980s was because we weren't collecting enough revenue. Because you and I know that revenues jumped an average of 7.5% a year. Now you can't find a company, you can't find a family, you can't find anyone that if they were getting 15% more every 24 months couldn't live within that budget. The single exception to that is not the city of Columbus, not the state of Oklahoma, the single exception to people who could not live within a 15% increase every two years throughout the rest of the decade is the Congress of the United States because they increase spending at 9% a year. And, and it's the height of wimpishness to sit here and say, well, the reason we couldn't do it is Ronald Reagan's fault. He didn't tell us how. No, when Ronald bill. Reagan, Ronald Reagan came up here every year with a spending pattern that went down over five years. And he said, if you eliminate this program, and if you reduce that, we will get to a balanced budget. And the first two or three years, it got so bloody down there in front of the cameras that fortunately the Democrat caucus began to coordinate it. And they would say on, they would have people that would come and speak how it was dead on arrival in defense, and it was dead on arrival in agriculture, and it was dead on arrival in the interior. And they would coordinate over a period of weeks to say, we are going to increase spending because each one of these, de these programs and, and uh, budgets from the president are dead on arrival. Now, 10 years later, ending up exactly where we said we were, increasing spending at a greater percentage than increasing in revenue. Now they sit back and say, you know, we killed all those bills, but nevertheless, uh, even though we never did implement their plans, and each year he had to shift them out a year, and each year he had to shift them out a year, and each year he had to shift them out a year, therefore, since he never did send us the balanced budget, Ronald Reagan's fault. Well, he never did send us a balanced budget, but I'll tell you something, Mr. McCune, there were opportunities here for the Republicans to have taken up the, the, the president's budget that, uh, that they neglected to do. Please, people please, Mr. Chairman, I'm a member of the Rules Committee. Please explain to me how Republicans do that trick. Well, how maybe, can we get our maybe, budget on the floor of the House? Maybe it, maybe they do it by telling the truth, not coming up here and saying they're going to offer it and going down to the House and not offer it. That's how they do it. Mi mi Mr. Chairman? How do we get our budget heard on the floor? Well, I don't know. Evidently, there was an agreement here in the Rules Committee to, to have placed it on the agenda, and it wasn't done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a Rules General, Committee problem, yeah, not mine. I requested that last year, and Mr. Frenzel said he was going to do it. And, and we took him at his word. Yet, unfortunately, he didn't, did not hold his word. Uh, and so we did not, you did not have the opportunity. Mr. Gordon, uh, can you explain to me? Year. All right, I'd like to get a budget heard on the floor. Will you uh, explain to me how I get that done? Well, you're going to have a chance to vote on the president's budget. How do year. I get it done? You're going, to, you're going to have a chance to vote tomorrow. The truth of the matter is I cannot because Democrats control this committee 9 to 4 and nothing comes to the floor without your approval, the and therefore the that ends the discussion. When, the Mr. when, Mr. when the chairman here, when the chairman here suggested 
that we sh should have brought them up during those times. The truth of the matter is the average American doesn't understand that not a single budget by Mr. Michael. Yeah, excuse me. I didn't want to interrupt my gentleman with all my time. If he has something that he wishes to say, I'm sure he, he could just maybe turn up his volume a little bit and, and I'll continue on with my time. The truth of the matter is, the reason we couldn't have a bill heard on the floor any one of those years, the reason we couldn't do it was because the Rules Committee decides what comes to the floor, and we were denied that opportunity each single year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Boynton. Well, Mr. Chairman, the uh, fact of the matter is that, uh, that, 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 that we allowed that to be offered on the floor of the House of Representatives, and we had difficulty finding any Republicans who would offer that budget. Uh, there's a, a, an old Abbott and Costello routine where, where uh, Bud Abbott says to Costello, if you, you got 50 bucks in one pocket and 100 bucks in another, what would you have? And Costello says, somebody else's pants. <laughs> and basically, that, that's, that's what we're talking about uh, in terms of, of where the brakes have gone over the last 12 years around here. They've gone into somebody else's pants. And this isn't very complicated. This is a very simple debate we're having here when you really strip away a lot of the rhetoric. It's whose side are you on? If you're on the side of those who have done very well over the last 12 years, you will support the proposal that was suggested by Mr. Archer and, and, and the Republicans. Now, under the, the plan that, that uh, the President submitted, those people who make over $200,000 a year or over We'll get on an average a change of about $8,000 in tax relief. Under the proposal 4200 offered by the Republicans, $12,000 in tax relief. What we're suggesting is that it's time for people in the middle to get the breaks. They have not gotten the breaks over the last 12 years. And I don't think, with all due respect to my good friend Tony, that $800 and middle income tax relief is peanuts. I know a lot of people in my congressional district and throughout this country who can use $800. I believe one of the reasons that the economy isn't moving is that there is a need to put money in the pockets of middle income people who are squeezed. You can have all the investments you want at the top. You can build all the strip malls you want. You can buy all the capital equipment you want, but if there's no one in the middle to purchase it, you're not going to crank the engine up. And I haven't, frankly, been very in impressed with, with economists, speaking of economists this morning. These are the same folks that have been telling us for the last year and a half that this recession was over, that we weren't going to be into a double dip, that the growth this quarter or that or the next quarter was going to be twice as much as it actually was. They haven't been right. What we're offering is a different way, a different approach. And you can call it what you want. Uh, uh, it's different than trickle down. It's bubble up. It's putting money in the pockets of people and letting them spend it, let them create demand. And by creating that demand, hopefully, we will have the opportunity with the second part of this package, which is investment, uh, uh, to produce the engine that will get this economy moving. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for bringing this legislation to us. I'm hopeful that uh, we will have a successful debate on the floor and we can move it on to the Senate. Would the gentleman yield for one question? Sure. Would the gentleman help me with an answer that I posed to the, to the chairman? What percentage should the top 1% or if you choose 5%, what percentage of the overall burden should they carry in order to, for us to have a fair tax bill? I don't know. Yeah. Would 30% would be enough? I don't know. I'd have to look at the overall so these burden constant, shared. So this constant chanting of fairness is really more rhetoric than it is goal because we really don't even know what we're headed toward, do we? Well, we know what we're headed for in this bill, and what we're headed for in this bill is we're asking for people that make over a million dollars a year uh, to, to help those in the middle who have been losing their, their income purchasing power. We're asking people in, in corporations who have compensation over a million dollars a year to reduce that deduction that they've had so middle-income people could have some purchasing power. We're asking people, who, yeah. couples who make over $145,000 a year to sacrifice and help this economy Your moving to provide middle-income people with some support. So we know we're doing that. Mr. Week. Mr. Chairman, we uh, often have philosophical debates in the Congress and in this Rules Committee. And that's expected. 
uh, but we like to do it in a way that uh, we can argue the merits of our various cases and we can respect each other and, and our process. Uh, but I'm disappointed when I hear statements that are uh, just uh, outright wrong and uh, when I suspect that the, uh, the person who makes the statements understands that they are factually incorrect. The process of the Rules Committee is to, to put out a rule that uh, governs how the budgets will be discussed every year. And I've been on this Rules Committee for 10 years and I remember a wide variety of budgets that have been on the floor. From the freezes, the hard freeze, the soft freeze, uh, the gold standard budgets, the freshman's budget, the conservative caucus budgets, the congressional black caucus budgets, the democratic budgets, and even the Republican and the president's budgets over the years. And each and every year without failure, there has been an opportunity for the president to have his budget submitted to the floor. I will admit that in some years, the, either the president or perhaps the Republican caucus has, or the Republican conference has chosen not to put the president's bill on the floor. But that has not been because this Rules Committee and the Congress of, and the House of Representatives have not given the president and the Republican Party that opportunity. Mr. Hall. Mr. Gordon. Well, I think it's time to stop pointing fingers. Get on the action. And I, and I thank Chairman Roskankowski for his committee taking this challenge, uh, promptly uh, bringing it uh, to us, and now let's get it on the floor and let's move forward. The American public deserves that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I say anything, I want to thank you for, uh, on behalf of all of us who push for manufacturing all the time, for including IDBs for manufacturing. And I really do believe it's going to make a difference. But I want to comment on a couple of other things. It seems to me that two things that have really caused great grief for the middle class in the last number of years is uh, not being able to put any value on debt, for example, not being able to deduct the interest on cost of automobiles. I don't know what effect that may have had on car sales in this country, so I can't make a case. But I do know a little bit more about the cost of college loans and, and my family and my neighbors and everybody else I know and everybody on my staff, the fact that they've been paying off the college loans without any possibility of relief has really kept them, as there's been a severe limit on the, their buying power and even in some cases I think their future. So I'm pleased to see that you've included that and for college loans in this bill. And I wonder, as I understand at least this chart, am I correct in saying that there's no provision for, uh, for college loan uh, um, payback on? That you have. But how about the alternatives? So there's nothing in there? On either None of them. They did not address the problem of student loans at all. Well, I tell you, I, I think that at least if I indicate from the people that I know and the mail that I get, that this alone and numbers of American people would really urge passage on this bill, and so do I. Thank you. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next panel before the committee will be the Honorable Bill Archer and the Honorable Robert Michael. Michael, Mr. Archer. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the uh, committee, thank you for hearing both Bill and me in tandem here because we've been co-sponsors of the administration's bill. I guess I have to express my own disappointment, not surprised with the process which has brought us uh, before your committee today to consider the bill HR 4210 the economic growth bill for which no one, frankly, claims responsibility. That's the base bill. It's a bill introduced by the majority leadership and incorrectly described as the President's economic stimulus package. This measure has a curious history. Besides being a case of mistaken identity, it has given short shrift to the Ways and Means in the Ways and Means Committee markup on February 12th. It was reported from the committee without recommendation after just two and a half hours of consideration, which I'm certain is record time for a tax bill markup. Usually it takes that long to wrap the special interest goodies in cellophane. Now, it was intended to set the stage to allow two packages to be brought to the House, one Democrat and one Republican. And someone with a suspicious cast of mind might almost reach the conclusion that the Democratic leadership was never serious about working out a package to stimulate economic growth. 
Why else was the Democratic alternative formulated behind closed doors during the last week and a half with various versions leaked to see how numerous interest groups would react? Now we're presented with a Democratic alternative which appears to cater to many groups but which still has as its cornerstone the temporary middle class tax cut paid for by a hefty and permanent tax increase. Now, most experts I have spoken with say that such a redistribution of wealth does nothing to stimulate the economy and create jobs, and that the higher taxes may put on an additional drag on the economy. Now, the distinguished chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Uh, Rostenkowski, tells us the economic experts told him mm, roughly the same thing. Furthermore, the majority totally exempts the legislation from the Graham-Rudman discipline, the $22 billion deficit in fiscal year 92 and and 93 is glossed over completely. It's claimed that this deficit will be made up in later years. Now, if you believe that, we have, as Mr. Sangas puts it, counseling available outside. What we have witnessed in the House since President's January 28th State of the Union address doesn't, it uh, 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 demeans the legislative process. It practically ignores it. I can remember the days of yore when uh, the two parties worked together in the uh, traditional legislative way of debating proposals freely and constantly refining the product until we reached consensus. This has not happened to this point, and now we hear that the Democratic majority wants uh, an up or down vote on two distinct packages, as uh, if the complicated economic problems of our country can be decided on an either-or basis. I regret this and frankly would prefer, prefer an open rule. Now I know open rules generally for anything coming out of Ways and Means Committee is a no-no because of the temptation to just have it get completely uh, broken open. But under such an open rule, Congressman Archer and myself would offer H.R. 4200 as a substitute amendment to 4210. And uh, as you are aware, 4200 contains the seven economic stimulus provisions enumer enumerated by the President in his State of the Union message. And let me take this opportunity again to clearly, I uh, went back to uh, see exactly what the President said in his State of the Union message. He talked about two specific uh, measures. And I've told him in the early days, I said, don't expect other than a simplified package to be enacted by any date certain because it's absolutely impossible to get into the array of all the arguments that would exist and, and ought, properly ought to be, be, be debated between the two parties. That narrowed down the first, uh, the first package to that which is achievable. And uh, the problem was then when Mr. Rostenkowski asked us to do, introduce the entire gamut that was 49 provisions of the President's entire State of the Union message, and uh, that was never intended on the part of the administration to have enacted by March 20th, simply the narrowed down group of seven that are economic stimulus to the, to the engine that creates jobs. That's what we were talking about there. The other part would come later, and we'd argue it. And you folks that talk about a middle income tax cut and our side would talk about uh, whether or not we increase the personal exemption five five hundred uh, dollars a person, those are big items. Matter of fact, on our side, I looked at it with twenty four billion dollars. They said, "How do you come up to pay for that?" About the only way, quite frankly, that I could see was if after the budget committee deliberations and we decided maybe we could take some more out of defense, but not until we'd had that debate later on in the year then it could maybe offset. And that's frankly what the President, in turn, had in mind. Two distinct bills. But our distinguished friend, Mr. Rostenkowski, laid down the gauntlet. I'm going to have one tax bill, not two. Now, that was his arbitrary decision. It flew in the face of what we would like to have had done tactically around here, the art of the achievable by March 20th, the balance, whenever we get around to doing it in our own sweet time and in combination with the Senate and sometime hopefully before the election or whatever. And maybe it wouldn't have happened. If it wouldn't, it wouldn't. But that was the overall plan here and, uh, and uh, the President's uh, uh, position, I think, gets to be undermined by what we've heard uh, by some of the rhetoric uh, that has uh, that we've uh, had to listen to. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the, uh, if I might, uh, just uh, enlarge upon what I had envisioned when two parties work together. And frankly, we've had a situation where we've had an amendment to the amendment, a substitute 
to the base bill and an amendment to the substitute. That way you work and refine a piece of legislation. We could still end up with basically two different kind of propositions out there, but we would have had the opportunity in which to really debate it fully like we did in the old days. And shucks, as important a measure like this, one day, two days, what's wrong with a full day, a full week's debate on, on, a, on an issue as important as this? So I would argue, I guess, Mr. Chairman, in summary, really, that as open a rule as we could possibly have, the better off we are in really achieving some kind of consensus here, rather than this simple take it or leave it, either or, and then uh, hopefully, uh, and I don't know, conceivably, uh, uh, we've heard what the President uh, has already said about about the tax increases that are incorporated in the Democratic package and that he'd be forced to veto it. Now, that's not the the whole process doesn't end here in the house we have to hear from the other body and uh, the excuse me sometimes that can be rather a torturesome and long a long uh, road but uh, i'd be happy at this juncture mr chairman to give way to my colleague mr archer he, he serves as our distinguished ranking member on the ways and means committee and and uh, is mr rostenkowski's counterpart on that very distinguished committee <clears throat> mr chairman thank you for holding for holding these hearings and uh, attempting to move uh, forward expeditiously uh, in the time frame that's so essential to the economy of this country. I, I really don't know where to start after listening to all of the exchanges uh, that have occurred this morning. I do know that um, we as a democracy within the framework of a constitutional republic should have differences in ideas. Those differences should be joined. They should be debated fairly before the American people and, and a resolution of the differences should occur within our system. It's not easy. Uh, it would be easier in a parliamentary system uh, to resolve differences. But it would not be as comprehensive or give the opportunity for the exchange that our system provides. I would only hope that as we enter into this effort to debate and to exchange ideas, that we do take into account the need of the economy and the need of the country. And that since we are not a parliamentary system, that we try to come together with a bill that the president will sign. It gains us nothing if we have confrontation and the president cannot sign the bill and we have to start all over again. It does not help the American people. Unfortunately, at, up to this point, there has been, to my knowledge, not any significant effort to reach some understanding with the president and the majority in the House. I come here today in a very unusual situation because normally I sit next to Chairman Rostenkowski and support the request for the rule that is made by a majority in our committee. I cannot do that today because I must tell you honestly, I do not believe that it was a normal proceeding in the Ways and Means Committee. Bob Michael has outlined the history of what's happened. The President made his State of the Union address. Chairman Rostenkowski said we've got to have a bill in, la in legislative language. And Mr. Derrick, it was put together. And it was put together in a short time and submitted a comprehensive omnibus bill that is about this thick. And it is the full extent of the President's proposals. If the committee wished to put that before the floor of the House in its entirety with the self-executing rule, you would be accommodating a vote on the President's complete proposal. But in order to do all of the tax provisions, it required spending cuts. Now, I don't know where it's written in stone tablets, Mr. Chairman, that we can only have one tax bill in a legislative year or that we cannot use spending reductions as a means of providing tax reductions. But this process today denies spending reductions as a basis of tax reductions and in effect requires that we have only one bill in one legislative year. The 
the chairman then communicated with Bob Michael and me that, that he could not work from a comprehensive bill with all of the complete legislative language. I found that rather interesting also because our committee rarely works from any statutory language when we go through our markup process. In fact, I can't think of the last time when on a major tax bill we have worked from statutory language. We have worked from what has always been called the chairman's mark, which he makes the determination of and puts before the committee. And in the end, after the process is completed, we introduce a clean bill. Not so this time. In previous committee deliberations, we have always had amendments offered by individual members to improve the bill. Not so. One must wonder what was going on when a package of this size and this importance can be reported out with no amendments being offered and with the truncated version of the president's proposal having been introduced by your, uh, by your minority, majority leader, uh, Mr. Gebhardt, and being reported out by a straight party line vote in our committee. That just doesn't happen, Mr. Chairman. Something is not normal in this procedure. Bob Michael and I did come back, and we introduced a strictly tax package within the jurisdiction of our committee that included the seven items that the president, as Mr. Michael said, asked for in his first package to be passed by March the 20th. Many people here speak for the president. The president should speak for himself. That's what he said. That's what he wanted. Understanding that it would be more laborious to take spending cuts to offset other tax cuts. But that was not satisfactory either to use as a base for markup. And so we saw this distorted version of the president's package which he would never have introduced and which Bob Michael and I would never have introduced because, as someone over here said, it was $53 billion in deficit. And the hallmark of the President's State of the Union address, which limited him greatly, was that he was going to adhere to the budget disciplines and not increase the deficits. That's extremely fundamental and important, not just to Mr. Hall, but certainly to me and to the President. So H.R. 4200 does comply with the Budget Enforcement Act and does not increase the deficits. However, as the process went on, we learned that what was intended was that this was basically just a simplified exercise which Mr. Solomon called a mock-up, and that the actual bill would be written later and changed and changed and changed again that would be offered as a Democrat substitute. Now, I've got to say to all of you on the Democrat side that you cannot genuinely say that Mr. Gebhardt's bill is the President's proposal, $53 billion in deficit with no spending cuts and that you're going to offer a vote on that because you well know there will not be one vote for that. There will not be one vote on your side and there will not be one vote on our side. That should tell the American people something. We should honestly be forthright in the procedures by which we debate our differences. And yet on a straight party line vote in our committee, your committee was to be asked for a rule that would deny us the opportunity to make any changes in H.R. 4200 and that we would be locked in to that as a substitute on the floor. Now that's why I'm not sitting here next to Mr. Rostenkowski today, Mr. Chairman. I cannot understand this. I don't know who's responsible for it. 
But the only suggestion that I can offer to you is that the motivation can only be for some partisan advantage in a presidential election year. While the Democrat alternative is being subject to change and change and may even be changed again as we sit here and offered as a substitute that we would be locked in and not be able to make any changes in our package. I don't think that's fair, Mr. Chairman, and I don't believe that you will certify that because I know the kind of person you are and the way you run this committee. I have no quarrel with the request for two hours of general debate with one hour on each of the substitutes. But as I mentioned earlier, to call Mr. Gebhardt's bill, 4210, the President's bill, is just not accurate because the President insisted no deficits. And this has a $53 billion deficit in it. I think we should have the same opportunity to change our bill as we see fit and offer that as an alternative on the floor. My belief is that we would only make one minor change, Mr. Chairman, and that would be to clarify the provision of the capital gains proposal so that nobody would be disadvantaged compared to current law. And through error, a minor error in the statutory language, under the recapture of depreciation on the sale of real estate, it is possible for an individual to be treated more disadvantageously under the President's proposal than under current law. And it would simply lock in a maximum tax rate of 28 percent which the current law provides for the recapture of depreciation. That is the only change I personally would like to make. But if the chairman's request and your leadership request is honored, we will not have the opportunity to make any change. We do not want to get into a bidding war, Mr. Chairman. We have said that from the beginning. Chairman Rostenkowski has said he did not want to get into a bidding war, and yet that is precisely what seems to have happened within the caucus of both the Democrat members of the Ways and Means Committee and the overall caucus in the House. Because of the various changes that have been made, I read about it in the Washington Post on their editorial page, uh, and that's how I find out what's going on. We, we do not want to enter into a bidding war. But let me say for those like my friend Mr. Hall who are concerned about deficits that the Democrat alternative, as I understand it today, which may be changed again, provides for a $30 billion deficit in the first two years. Now the Budget Act requires that any proposal be budget neutral in each of the five years, not just over the five year period. And what concerns me is that even though it picks up the revenue in the outer years by making the tax increases permanent and eliminating the tax reductions for middle income class after two years, it leaves the first two years terribly exposed. And, and Mr. Bielenson, you have concerns about this, and I, and I want to share my concern with all of you on both sides of the aisle. Under the budget restrictions, under which we operate. Once a year is closed, it no longer counts in the budgeting process. Once we close a year with a deficit, we, number one, have forced additional borrowing on the Treasury, which pushes interest rates up. But number two, we start the new year with a clean slate. We never recover that. And anyone who thinks that extra money that is available in the budget in succeeding years is going to be used to offset previous deficits or previous debt has not paid much attention to the way the Congress has always operates. Then after the end of the second year, that deficit will be moved out of the formula and out of the process. And all we will be looking at is years where we are creating extra revenue and you and I both know that will be spent either on spending increases or tax reductions. 
we have shown no courage, the majority of the Congress has shown no courage in letting additional revenues today go against deficits from previous years. So the request to you is to waive the Budget Act so that these $30 billion of deficit in the first two years will be okay. That waiver of the Budget Act will put $30 billion of extra debt on your children and my children and their children and all of the interest charges to carry that during their lifetimes. So that is a very, very important item. But once we waive the budget restrictions in any one category, Mr. Chairman, we weaken those disciplines in every other category. And it will be more difficult for you to resist requests on other very appealing items. And I, for one, believe that would be very dangerous for the country. But perhaps more importantly, we need to do something for jobs. The President will not sign the, the Democrat alternative. He has said that specifically. And we are delaying this process. And I regret that. Because I would like for us to sit down and see if, with our differing views, that we could come together on a package that would truly help this country. And, and I, I personally hope, Mr. Chairman, that in your fairness, that you will permit us to change H.R. 4200 so that we can offer it as an alternative, not in a bidding war, but merely for the purpose of perfection, Give us the same opportunity that you would give your side on the floor when this bill is debated. Uh, I think that's fair, and I make that request to you. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you might Roger, have. Roger, you, you mentioned the change the tax rate on the recaptured depreciation from 31 to 28 percent. Yes. Is Under the current law, recapture of depreciation is, is capped at 28 percent. Right. And it should be capped in the same way under our proposal. Uh, that was apparently an error in drafting in the way that it was put in. We would like to be able to make that change. Is that the major amendment in your bill? Well, for, for me, I don't know yeah, if, first, if, if the leader has a desire to change it in some other way. But in fairness, we really ought to be able to change it in whatever way we wish. As long as yours is in flux and being changed, we should have the same opportunity. And, 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 and let me make this point. Uh, I support this president. I think he has been an outstanding president. But we as Republicans on our side of the aisle in the House, since we are not a parliamentary system, may have some other improvements that we would like to make on this package. I just want to correct. Our, our 4287 is not in flux. It's, it, that's finished. Uh, I don't well, but it has been in flux since the committee com uh, completed its deliberations, Mr. Chairman, and, and I hope you're right that it is finished and that's what, what will be on the floor. That's my understanding. But it has been changed several times, and we have not been permitted to make any changes on ours since the committee action. Mr. Derek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Archer, you know, I think, although I can't speak for the Rules Committee or the Democratic leadership, but uh, I think that one of the reasons that we had, and, and we regret, quite frankly, that uh, we had to have Mr. Gephardt introduce the uh, President's uh, uh, program. Uh, that was not uh, our wish. As I understand it, we have looked diligently uh, to find a member of, of your party who, who would introduce it. Uh, you know, the President uh, appeared before the nation, appeared before the Congress, and made a challenge to pass his bill, his uh, tax, uh, uh, tax bill. And to suggest that then, after doing that, that he does not give us an opportunity to vote on it seems to me to be a little ludicrous. And, you know, we do. And, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Frenzel is one of the most outstanding members that, that I ever served with in this body. But he did come before this body uh, last time and promised us that he would introduce or see that the president's uh, program was introduced, and for whatever reasons, uh, that never did materialize. And 
I guess that's one of the reasons that we are a little skittish about having an opportunity to vote on that. Now, that seems very fair to me uh, that we do that, and I, I don't see how anyone can argue with that. Now we come down to the, uh, to the well, other uh, two. May, may I respond uh, well, before, you, before you get? Otherwise, I'll wait until the end. But uh, let, let me finish, and I'll, I'll be glad to have you. Uh, 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 but, you know, as to the other two, the, the president is going to have an opportunity to have his plan voted on. The Democrats in the Congress are going to have an opportunity to have their plan voted on. And the Republicans in the Congress are going to have an opportunity to have their plan voted on. Now, you know, and I'm sure your plan is similar to our plan in, in, in the sense that, you know, I can take our plan and find some things that I don't like about it. And I'm sure there are many members that can take your plan that, uh, that, uh, and, and find things they don't like about it. But what we do is we give it our best shot. Uh, you know, this is a consensus government that we have, and we as Democrats get together and try to give it our best shot, and you as Republicans get together and try to give it your best shot. And, you know, unless you can point something out to me that I don't know, it seems to me that uh, your plan has been given basically the same courtesies uh, that, uh, that, that, that our plan has, and that it's been a very fair process. What could be fairer? then the, the two major parties in, in the House have an opportunity to express their will, as well as the House having an opportunity to express their will on uh, uh, the President's plan. Although it, it may not be the uh, everything in, in the President's plan, but it's basically the President's plan. And after all, you had an opportunity. The uh, uh, minority leader could have introduced the President's plan if, if he had chosen, or any Republican in the House. Okay. Well, Mr. May... That, let, let me let me just say that if the the proposition as you stated were supported by the facts, I would have no disagreement with it. I mentioned in my testimony. Well, they are the I facts as I see them. I mentioned in my testimony that Mr. Michael and I introduced the entire package of the president. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned also in our testimony, if you would like to give the opportunity for a vote on that entire package which, as you know, is this thick mm -hmm. in a self-executing rule, then you would, in fact, be giving the president a vote on his package. But you are not giving the president's package a fair consideration when you pick and choose at the subjective decision of the majority leader, Mr. Gephardt, what is going to be in his bill. Did you enter it is unpaid for, and the president clearly certified that he was not going to increase the deficits. And it is $53 billion in deficit. Did, that is not a vote on the president's package. Did you come package. before the Ways no. and Means and offer the entire president's package? Yes, we, I, I asked the chairman to put the entire bill before the Ways I mean, and Means you Committee. Offer it? It, did it, you it's, offer it? It's in the House. You're the leading... Uh, it, it, did you Bob, offer it? Bob Michael and I sponsored the entire package, yes. Our name is on it. 4150. 40, 4150 does not track with what our base bill was. And uh, my... It's a misrepresentation. Call 4210-4150 when, uh, when it isn't. It was added and, and subtracted from. It was a... It was taken from a rough draft which we did not use in final form for the bill that we introduced as the president's entire package. So that, that thing mean. is, that's what rankles me but more than anything. Now, it's a procedural kind of thing, but doggone it, it is important. I'll grant you that after we get a, after the base bill, giving us an opportunity for our seven points, we, the bill would like to have slightly adjusted technically on the one item and yours, then we're going more head on head on specifics, narrowed down to what the only practical thing we think is achievable by March 20th. The others, it's gonna take all year to debate some of those issues. And it, and it covers the gamut of committees. That was our problem because uh, it, it stretched across so many uh, committee borderlines to implement the president's entire program. But he specifically in his State of the Union message says, what I perceive to be the real economic stimulus is narrowed down to these seven points, the other, and he says, submerge your politics for that, and then after that I know 
you know, we're all grown men and women around here, and you're going to have your say, uh, um, as we both will, uh, for the balance of the year. It seems to me you make a strong argument for my point. You're getting what you want. You're getting an opportunity to vote on these points. But No, but, but we really are not, because we are being given a truncated version of the President's proposal, which in its entirety was introduced by Bob Michael and me, and is in statutory form and could have been put before the committee. And I asked the chairman to put it before the committee. It wouldn't be the first time that we put a bill before our committee that included provisions that were not within our jurisdiction. It happens all the time. And every one of the president's proposals would have then been available to the committee in true context. But taken out of context, it is not the president's proposal. And in addition, I would say, I would say in response to your, your comment of, of fairness between the two packages that will be made in order as substitutes, that your side had a month to prepare an alternative and to submit it to the committee so it could be voted on up or down when we had our deliberations. They did not do so. If they had submitted a package and you then said that could not be changed subsequent to the committee activity and it would have to be submitted as it was put before the committee on the floor and ours would have to be submitted as presented to the committee before the floor, that would have been fair. But they elected to wait and to change and to go through a, a process of evolution on their package, we should have been given the same opportunity after the committee finished its deliberations. That would be fair. Mr. Archer, the fact of the matter is, though, that 4200, which has been introduced, um, uh, does cover the seven points that the President said that he wanted passed by March the 20th. That is, I mean, and you can argue it any no, way no, you no, want hey, to, but that's... That, that is correct, but you should not be able to say, as you did earlier, mm -hmm that you're going to give the president a shot, you're going to give the House Republicans their shot, and you're going to give the House Democrats their shot. Well, well let me, I mean, we, uh, we have introduced the seven points that the president said that he wanted to get well, passed. We're, we're, well, we're, well, let me answer you, uh, uh, that, that he wanted passed by March the 20th. Uh, uh, that, that he wanted passed by March the 20th. You, as, a, as the uh, a ranking uh, Republican on the Ways and Means and, and the majority, I mean, the minority whip, have an opportunity to, to introduce what you want as far as, as the Republican plan is concerned. We have an opportunity uh, to introduce what we want as a Democratic plan. I fail to see anything that could be any fairer than that. Well, let, let, just it's a timing thing. Why should you be able to have yours in flux and make change after Ours change? Is not in flux. This is it has one. been, though, until just well, the last well, day. So, I mean, I assume yours was, um, too. No, you wouldn't let us. You would not let us. That, it, it is totally a timing thing. And, and it is not fair, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I just don't think that it's the way your committee wants to operate. Because if, in fact, the Republicans in the House are going to be given an opportunity in addition to the president, to make a minor correction in the president's proposal, we should be given that opportunity. But Mr. Archer, you have changed your capital gains uh, provisions, and it has been in flux. And no, sir. I mean, no, to sir. say that it has no, not. No, let, let's, not, let's not argue about the facts. The facts are that the capital gains provision was not changed, and the big bill initially that Bob Michael and I introduced has the very same capital gains provisions in it that H.R. 4200 has. It was not changed. So your staff has given you some inaccurate information on that. I'll let you know I do not rely on staff. Okay. Well, it, it they, came directly if they will read both bills, they'll find there has been no change. Right. Not most of the time, anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I find it very difficult to, uh, to be still here for the last, uh, last 10 or 15 minutes. My good friend, uh, Butler Derrick, and he is a, he is a good friend, he, and this, this certainly doesn't importune your patriotism at all, uh, but he reminds me of, of, of the communist philosophy. If you keep saying something long enough and often enough, uh, you hope people are going to believe it. And he no, keeps talking. I, I, no. I, 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 
do resent. I mean, oh, I no, no, don't, but, because but, I you don't know, in any well, way. Well, you know, I, I do. I could have said a liberal I, for some other Well, well a liberal I don't mind. Well, but, I mean, when you start talking about communism, now, well, come on, Jerry. Well, I mean, get serious. Well, get serious. I mean, you know, you, I don't appreciate it. Uh, if I'd have said... Mr. Derrick, no, uh, no, well, well, no, 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 wait a minute. If I'd, if I'd have said that about you, you would have already called me outside to have a fight. Now, if I'd have... if I'd have And you know darn well, and I demand an apology. You, you, if, if there was I an demand apology, an you apology. would have it, because All you right. are uh, highly okay. respected by me. All right. let, let, let me just uh, say why I felt that way, though, because, you, you know, Mr. Derrick uh, keeps saying if he could have found a Republican to introduce that bill. Now, you know, Mr. Archer and Mr. Michael, on February 11th, introduced the President's package, the split package, the seven points. February 11th. Anybody want to look at the bill? That's the date on it. I beg your pardon, it's February 7th. February 7th. Now, when did Mr. Gephardt introduce the bill? They couldn't find a Republican, so four days later, after you, Mr. Archer, and you, Mr. Michael, introduced the bill, it's in print. Mr. Gephardt puts the bill in. So let that uh, settle it once and for all, okay, as far as uh, who's, uh, you know, who's accurate here. You know, I've heard on that side of the aisle several members say, whose side are you on? You know, that is terribly demeaning to me as an American. Whose side are you on? Why can't we be on everybody's side? I mean, everybody's side is protecting jobs. And protecting jobs is stimulating the, the economy. Uh, I, I, I just can't understand that. My good friend, Mr. Derrick, again says, uh, let's, let's be, uh, everybody's been honest and fairer. And yet, we haven't followed the rules of the House. Let me show you something here. Let me just read you, Mr. Derrick. This is the first one I've been able to come across. I guess I could, but sometimes... Uh, uh, this one says, Summary of the substitute approved by the Democrat members of the Committee on Ways and Means, dated February 19th. You know, so I read that. I figured that was the Democrat substitute. Then I get one dated February 21st. Summary of uh, the Tax Fairness and Economic Growth Act. I mean, there's another version. It, it's all changed now. Here's another one, February 20th, uh, which says Summary of Provisions of the, of the Tax Fairness and Economic Incentive Act. All of these, here's, the, here's the, um, what may be the final version, uh, February 24th, although I'm not sure. But my point is, you talk about honest and fairness. Now, seriously, Mr. Derrick, no Republican on that Ways and Means Committee which is noted for their, their bipartisan cooperation, at least in the 14 years I've been here. It's not like our rules committee where we often get kicked around, uh, outnumbered nine to four. But there, Republicans, it seems to me, have always had their chance. And yet, there's nothing here that does that. You know, I guess the thing that, that really bothers me is uh, George Bush is being you know, hammered from the right and from the left for reneging on a, on a pledge of no new taxes. And yet, he was forced into a uh, compromise, whatever it was. Uh, he has the responsibility of governing. And he, he, he agreed to that tax increase. I think it was $146 billion. And you know, a lot of you voted for it. I could not bring myself to do it. But a lot of you voted for that because there was deficit reduction, controls brought in there, firewalls. And yet now, in, in, in the Democrats' bill here, 4287, as I uh, have listened to you, Mr. Archer and Mr. Michael, uh, this busts that budget agreement completely. Now, did we, did we give the American people a commitment? And, and I understand that the Government Operations Committee has just put out a bill that is now going to knock out all of the firewalls, and we're going to be able to cut the defense budget, not a reasonable $50 billion over years, but $100 billion? You know, this whole thing just doesn't make sense. We, as a body, are not doing our job, and it's no wonder that people want term limitations around here and want to throw these rascals out. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves with what we're doing. That's why we ought to go back to that committee, and we ought to get our heads together, and we ought to have a bill that's on everybody's side, that stimulates jobs. That's what America wants us to do. Why can't we do it, gentlemen and ladies? I don't even have a question, thanks. Mr. Billinson? I don't have a question either, but <laughs> first of all, may I say gently again to our Republican colleagues that it's the Democratic Party, not the Democrat Party. 
you guys, I, I suppose, on purpose keep you know saying it's the Democrat proposal. It's the Democratic proposal. But the gentleman yield. Well, just for a moment. No, Seriously, no. it was the Democratic Party when I belonged to it. When it became the Democrat I'm Party is when serious. I changed parties. I'm trying to be serious, Jerry. I mean, if you don't want to necessarily offend us, please refer to this as Democratic, not okay. Democratic. These gentlemen were kind enough to do so. Some of our friends over here don't do that. It's just, it's just you know, that's our name. Secondly, let me simply say, I think it's bad enough that, that both parties seem to feel that they have to reduce taxes this year because it's an election year. I don't, as I suggested earlier, I think that that's the, I think that, that that's what we should be doing. Um, I don't think we should make it worse by imposing what I believe to be unfair <coughs> restrictions in the rule. I don't see any reason why each party should not be allowed to present on the floor its proposal as it's as it's fixed it up at that particular point. I mean, there's no there's no statute of limitations on this time, on, on these things. If somebody comes up with a better idea to make their program or their or their plan a little bit better, let them put it in. Let the Republicans offer their plan. Let the Democrats offer their plan. And I think we should allow these chaps uh, to make any amendments that they want. I, fur I further think, I know I'm not making friends on my side, but I really don't understand why we're, why we're requiring that the, the president's, so-called president's plan be, be the base bill. As, as the gentleman from Texas, I guess, suggested, there aren't going to be any votes for it. Uh, nobody pretends to support it. Uh, these gentlemen, as I understand it, have in fact proposed the president's short-term plan, and that which is, that which is uh, one can deal with in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, it is way out of whack. The other, the, 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 the one which I guess our friend Mr. Gebhardt has introduced on behalf of the President, so to speak, is way out of whack in terms of its, of the, of the deficit. And I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think we're gaining anything politically. And uh, I, just, I think we're making the, the whole process more difficult. We have a difficult enough time as it is to get through this year without making things worse, let alone making them better. I'm convinced we're going to make them worse, not, not make them better, no matter which of these plans is, is passed. And I don't think that in, in the, you know, in the process that it makes any sense to, to ruffle unnecessarily the feathers and uh, amongst our, our friends here, or to make it more difficult for ourselves to get along well, or to try to try to do things as best we possibly can. I really do not understand why we're insisting that the so-called president so-called plan is, is, is the base bill. We do not understand why we're not allowing our Republican friends to, even as we should allow ourselves, if we come up with some suggested changes in our bill, uh, to, 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 to close the last moment to, to have that available to because they're all on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, for the past couple of hours, we've been operating on a partisan basis without really discussing the merits of each of the bills. We're going to do that on the floor. But before we get to the floor, I want to commend you, Mr. Archer and Mr. Michael, for your appearance today and your remarks and explaining what we should do. And I think you're exactly right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall? <clears throat> Mr. Wheat, any questions? No questions, Mr. Gordon. We've been here a long time. Let me just try to briefly summarize in, in my mind what's going on. Um, in the State of the Union, the President put forth a, uh, his plan for uh, moving the country forward domestically and economically, and I, and I compliment him for that. I think that it, that, that it was his responsibility, and I'm glad that he came forward with a plan. And uh, whether you agree with it or not, that's what he, he did what he should do. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, he called for this to be done by March the 20th, and I agree with that. I think we should act quickly, and I'm glad that he, that he did that. Now it seems that we're to the point of whether or not uh, Mr. Michael said that, that the President really didn't mean for the entire plan to go at first, but for it to be in segments. And so there's some disagreement as to whether that should be done. Um, uh, quite frankly, um, again, whether this bill is purported to be his, that is his uh, proposal or not, uh, if we don't agree with it, let's vote on it and vote against it and put it out of the way. That's simple enough. We'll have a chance. If you don't think it's his bill or if others don't like it, vote against it and it's gone. So that, that matter's over with. Now, then we need to put the proposals on the table as to, as to where we want to send the country. Now, my understanding, uh, and that I think it's what, it's 4200, uh, H.R. 4200 was the bill that uh, you proposed, Mr. Michael and Mr. Um, um, Archer, and that I think earlier today, um, uh, several, uh, Ross, Chairman Roskowski uh, 
had letters from a number of people saying this is what the present proposal was. It was a, a brief, you know, let's get started now proposal. Uh, and there was a drafting error uh, in it, which can happen to anybody. Uh, and, and, then, and if that drafting error is corrected, and I hope that you'll have that opportunity, um, then that's the proposal that, that you want, and that's the proposal that the President wants. Is that correct? At this time. Okay. Okay. And so that's what, and then so we'll have the opportunity. That's all we need to do so that you will have the opportunity to vote the way uh, you think the country should go. I have said that that is my personal desire, okay. and I believe it is the desire of the Republican leadership. Okay. But then I'm, would, I'm not certain I can speak 100% for the Republican leadership, uh, so I want to be very careful yeah. to couch my response. There's always, going to, there's always going to be somebody uh, with Democrat, Republican, whatever, that's going to have a, a contrary opinion. But I, I think this is a, a democracy when we try to work from the majority. And so I think it's clear then that that is the majority opinion of the Republican leadership in the House and, and the President's position. Desire on the part of a Democratic friend, you know, to feel well, the president, you know, if you didn't do, didn't honor uh, the, that uh, date of March 20th, you know, with the entire package, that was never the president's intention. He's going to be mighty satisfied to have the narrowed down scope that really, quite frankly, is what we consider to be job creating. The answer, my dear friend, Mr. Bielanson, you know, even in our proposal for a supposedly this $500. Uh, uh, family uh, personal increase in exemption. I don't look upon that as a means of creating jobs in the immediate instance at all. That's a much longer range kind of thing that we intend to talk about at some future date. But, uh, and I applaud the gentleman for his comments because I guess I've always felt we're not omnipotent in our proposal. You folks aren't omnipotent in your proposal. And that's what gives rise to what Bill and I have been trying to say that too bad that we can't find the kind of mechanism by which we feed off of two specific proposals and amend each one of them in a very orderly process. And you know how we do. We debate that and that last off amendment's got to be, all right, the next amendment, and we work our way back up the legislative tree to finally get a resolution of what there is consensus then finally in the House, hopefully to send something to the Senate. And there. But with this, with this drafting era amendment, then it will, the bill that you're proposing does reflect the majority opinion of the Republican Congress and the President. So, so there will be a fair opportunity then to, to, to make a choice between the Republican uh, proposal and direction for improving uh, the state of the economy and then the Democratic, uh, which all Democrats, you know, not 100 percent support. But at least we'll have a fair uh, chance to vote between the two directions. Is that, is that accurate? On that limited portion of what we intend to do. Well, right? okay. Let, let, okay. let me express one caveat, and that is there is a very significant difference in approach, Mr. Gordon, because the chairman of our committee has laid down a rule that we can only have one tax bill this year. And we are saying that it's not written in stone tablets that we can only have one tax bill. So I just think that should be made clear. Sure. But you're but, getting what but, you but, you... but you're getting a chance... At this moment, at this moment, for the March 20th deadline, yeah. yes. Right. And so if this drafting error is, is corrected, then you're going to, you know, you will have the opportunity to present and vote on what, what you want and what you think uh, the president wants. And I guess more than think since a number of his uh, his uh, representatives have sent letters here to that effect and so there'll be so we'll all have a chance to make a clear distinction and to vote on what we think is right and move forward with this so let's you know uh, I hope that we'll go ahead and whether the earlier bill is the president's or not the president's let's vote it let's vote it down uh, get it out of the way and then let's have that good clear choice so that you'll have a chance to put forth uh, your vision of where the country needs to go uh, uh, in the short term economically. That, that is my request today. Thank you. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, gentlemen, for coming. It's a difficult dilemma, unnecessary in my opinion, because we did some right things in America in the early 1980s. From 1981 to 87, the cost of capital, $180,000 needed for every job in America. The cost of capital was the lowest of any place on the planet. And over the last five years, with this greed and fairness debate, We've done away with some of those incentives, such as individual retirement accounts. Only one person in five qualifies for an individual retirement account. All of the other incentives that created jobs, two out of every three jobs on this planet 
were created in America between 1982 and 1990. Two out of every three jobs on the planet, more, twice as much as the rest of the world combined. And over the last four years, little by little, we've turned the knobs that have discouraged savings and investment productivity and growth, and America's paying the price for it. Now, rather than going back and undoing those mistakes, we have before us this increased greed debate. Tax, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. Same 1970s stuff that we heard when we increased taxes on energy production that just cost, sent the price of gasoline in 1981 to $1.74 a gallon. Fortunately, by undoing that damage, we brought it down to it's only $1.09 today. So I would hope that we could go further. Your message is, is good. It's a step in the right direction. But the Congress of the United States is controlled by a political philosophy that is out of step with the world. You saw the debate on C-SPAN over the weekend as to what happened in the budget debate in Sweden, where they're cutting taxes. And throughout Mexico, zero capital gains, Eastern Europe and elsewhere. We are out of sync by about 30 years of the idea that if you tax working people more, somehow or another that's good for them and the deficits will disappear. Imperial evidence has proven just exactly the opposite. And I wish you success on the floor. Uh, you've tried to portray the, the Democratic position here, and uh, I won't debate that. I just want to ask you the question. If Mr. Archer and Mr. Michael get the bill that they are, get the amendment to the bill that they have recommended, does that adequately uh, express to you the, the Republican philosophy and the direction that we should, that, that, that you would like to see the country move? Mr. Gordon, uh, I don't want to be sophisticated about this, but my major is economics. And everything doesn't fall into cute little piles of Democrat and Republican. I'm just saying the bill. I mean, does that, is that... And is, so therefore, not even close. Okay, so... so not the, even close. So the I bill that Mr. Archer and Mr. Michael are... Did you want me to answer or did you want to engage in okay, the Okay, I thought you did. So therefore, I think that America should be doing what Czechoslovakia is doing and what Poland is doing and what Eastern... what Germany is doing along with Japan and Korea and Taiwan and the other job creators. And we should have a zero capital gains, just as President of Mexico has seen. That's where we should be going. Okay. Mr. General, Mr. General, Mr. General, Mr. General, Sure. Sure. You're pleased to go. Well, uh, I'm listening to what Mr. Archer and what Mr. Michael are saying, that uh, the partisan solution is, yes, if they give us that bill, then we can have an up or down vote. That doesn't give us the American solution of getting a bill, because the President has sworn to veto that bill, same as Paul Sangas has said he would veto it. We need an open rule so that we can do what Mr. Michael was talking about, so that we can amend yours, you can amend ours, we can work our will on the, on the floor of this House, and we can get a, something that the American people are going to appreciate, and that is an economic growth package. That's what we want. Is well, that right? and, and, and could I just be very clear on this? Uh, because if you change the leadership's request to you for the rule, which apparently Mr. Bielenson and which you have said you believe is fair. Then for this moment, I think we operate under a fair procedure. <clears throat> However, the long-term structural needs of this country, the changes in the tax code and the spending that need to be done are certainly not satisfied by our mere short-term March 20th uh, jobs incentive. And I, I just want to make that clear because I, I don't want to hear rhetoric We've given you everything you want, and now there's nothing more that you should want because clearly there's a lot more that needs to be yeah, done for this country. Maybe more after March 20th, but as far as what you want right now, and as far as meeting uh, the, 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 the president's reasonable request of action by March 20th, that's, that's what you want. That's correct. That's correct. And, that's, and, and that is the, the position of the majority of the Republicans in the House and the president. So, so if you'll get that, then you'll get the tools that, that you want right now. And if you give us enough votes to go with our little minority to pass it, that'd be great, okay. too. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The uh, next uh, member to uh, be heard by the panel, the Honorable Brian Donnelly of Massachusetts. Thank, thank, you very, uh, thank you very much. I thank you very much for your patience and waiting you. so long. I uh, had had a long technical detailed uh, explanation of my request to the committee, but it looks like you have a long day under the Klieg likes, Mr. Chairman. If I could submit it for the record. Sure. Without objection, the entire statement And then maybe the uh, just takes a, a brief bit of time and succinctly explain uh, my, my, my request to the committee.
My request deals with the uh, individual income tax cut on the package that, uh, that, that came out of the Democratic uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, technically and unfortunately how it's structured, Mr. Chairman, it's structured that an individual will be, will be eligible uh, for a tax cut as a percentage of what they pay to the Social Security system. Uh, as you and I know well, there are five million uh, public employees that belong to a contributory pension system that is not Social Security, and almost two million federal employees that, uh, that, that belong to a contributory system that's not the so Social Security system. Because of this technical flaw in the bill would be ineligible for any tax, uh, any tax cut, either as an individual or, or, or if they file jointly. Uh, it would seem to me uh, we're talking here about quintessential middle class people if we're talking about a middle class tax cut. Uh, these are, these are uh, firemen and policemen in Boston, uh, teachers in Ohio, uh, the Texas teachers, uh, county sheriffs, people all across the country with no fault of their own because of decisions made on a state or local basis when Social Sec Security was created in the 30s, had their own pension system and, uh, and opted to stay in that own pension system. It's a contributory system. Uh, in many cases, these individuals have contributed at a higher rate uh, to their pension system than Social Security demands of other workers in this economy. So uh, in, in brief, Mr. Chairman, what I'm requesting is that there be some way uh, to mitigate the impact on these uh, 7 million Americans who will assume, because they are middle class people, if this legislation becomes law, that they would be eligible for that same sort of tax break uh, that their neighbors uh, and, their, and their fellow residents of their, of their localities uh, would receive because they are uh, members of the Social Security system. I, and in fairness, I attempted to solve this uh, at the Ways and Means Committee caucus because I didn't want to have to uh, bring it here to the Rules Committee, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, it was voted down. There are a lot of people that have misconceptions uh, about exactly why people do and don't belong to the Social Security system. Uh, and uh, the, the reality is that the, these systems that are contributory retirement systems uh, were created prior to the creation of Social Security. And when Social Security was created, those individuals had the right, or those uh, uh, cities and towns and states at the time had the right to join or not to join. It was in their own interest, in the interest of their employees at that point in time, not to join because you remember Social Security was only to be a supplement to people's retirement. And, and that's what they were told in the 30s and that's why they didn't join. So uh, even though it's technical, it does affect uh, uh, seven million people in America, and I just think on the issue of fairness and equity, if there's some way I have made a proposal to the committee, I'll be happy to have my staff work with your staff so that uh, all the members of the committee understand how it affects uh, the, uh, the, the constituencies that, that they represent. Uh, and it's states like Massachusetts, Ohio, California, Texas, and others, Tennessee, and others that are, that are adversely affected by this. What do the chairman have to say, Brian, on this? Well, the, the chairman's staff has told me since the time of the committee decision that he'd be willing, he wants to work something out uh, on this issue. Uh, firefighters in, in Cook County, for example, belong to a contributory system that's not Social Security. Uh, and, uh, you know, this breaks down an individual congressional district level. Uh, and uh, w what my amendment simply would do would be to count their contribution to their retirement program the same as we count an individual's 7.5% uh, uh, contribution to Social Security. Y using the exact same formula so there'd be no double dipping uh, and that uh, they would receive the exact same as people that, that belong to Social Security. Uh, just one final point, Mr. Chairman. On the other hand, if their spouse works, if their spouse works and is a contributor to Social Security and they file jointly and the spouse works a full-time job, uh, not a part-time job, those married people filing jointly would probably be, be eligible because you could count in the spouse's contribution to Social Security. Unfortunately, the people that will be affected are people that are either not married or those that have spouses that are at home, maybe in, in most instances raising the children, uh, some of the people that we want to help most in America. So the number of raw is seven million, uh, but it's almost impossible unless you go through individual income tax returns 
to find out how many of those spouses are working in and contributing into the system. It's just a problem that we're faced before, as you understand, Mr. Chairman, and it's this overlay of retirement systems that, that we have in this country between our private sector workers and our government workers. We attempted to address the issue in the mid-'80s when we reformed the federal pension system, uh, and uh, which many, for example, I joined the new system, so pay Social Security, 401K, et cetera. But there are many people that are older federal employees that was in their own interest to stay in. And those people are contributing, I think, as high as maybe 7 or 8 percent, even more than, than Social Security. So you, you contribute more than Social Security, but would be ineligible under the technical way that this bill is, is drafted. Mr. Hall. Chairman, uh, Brian, Ohio is in the same boat. Same boat. Uh, do you have any figures there in front of you to... Uh, relative to the only people in Ohio uh, uh, that would make any contribution into the Social Security system were those that were hired after 1986. In an right. attempt to solve this dilemma, there's a lot of us from what are called the zero participation state that worked a compromise in 1986, much to the chagrin of, of some of the people we represent, that all new employees, that all, all, all new hires would, would join the Medicare system. And so what, what would happen, uh, Mr. Hall, is that they, would, they now contribute 1.45 percent of, of their gross income into the Medicare trust fund because they would become eligible for Medicare at, at the age of 62 or 65. However, the lowest paid public employees at, with only a contribution against your gross of 1.45 percent uh, would be probably eligible instead of for $200 uh, tax credit, probably for a 20 or $30. And it just seems to me, if we're, if we're going to do this for everybody and if it becomes law, uh, it seems that we, we ought to make this special consideration. It's a problem that's going to vex us for some time. And again, I apologize having to come to the committee for some sort of relief, but there are, frankly, some members of our committee that, in all due respect, don't understand how these systems How many states I, I are affected by this, Brian? There are about uh, 30 states that are affected in whole or part, in whole or part, many part. Uh, when you go in some of the southern states, you'll find uh, municipal teachers uh, associations or county sheriffs. The two biggest states are, are Massachusetts and Ohio and, and, then, and then California and Texas uh, because the Texas Teachers Association. It's something that the Congress is going to have to address was there, eventually. Uh, was this costed out? It was costed out and uh, very, very quickly, Mr. Chairman, it was costed out somewhere between $200 million and $500 million. It's impossible to tell because we don't know. And that was an off-the-top cost estimate by, uh, by joint tax, because unless we look at individual filers, we're only making <coughs> guesstimates. What my amendment um, uh, to, to, to deal with the uh, budget, uh, you know, the budget rules under which we work, what my amendment would do uh, would be to assume that the additional cost, because of the rectification of this problem, uh, would s the bill would still be budget neutral because, as you know, there's uh, $17.1 billion, I think, that is, that is being used because of the drop of the corporate tax rate cut that would then go to the deficit. And, and I understand the, uh, the budget implications, but I, I think we're also going to have problems to say to really quintessential middle class people because of no fault of your own. Uh, you know, Joe gets a tax cut, but, but Mary doesn't. Yeah. It's a... I'd like to look into it. I'd like to see that, uh, that cost up. I'll, I'll make sure my staff gets a hold of Joint Tax again this afternoon and, and gets to your staff as quickly as possible an, an updated cost estimate on this. Again, they've always had problems on this because the figures we're relying on, frankly, are 1986 figures, the last time we really dealt no. with this issue. Moynihan proposal to reduce the income or the... Uh, Oh, I think, I, I think the most onerous and unfair tax that we have, on my personal opinion, the onerous and unfair tax we have uh, is the Social Security tax. It's a flat, across-the-board tax that taxes everybody ir irrespective uh, uh, of, 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 of their income. Unfortunately, uh, it, and it was sustainable, I suspect, years ago when it was only 1% of income or 3% of income. But it's a really, I mean, many of our people now, you know, I represent a working class district, they'll pay more in Social Security taxes than, than they will of, of their federal tax liability, or certainly of their state tax liability in, in Massachusetts. Uh, I, I just don't know how uh, we make those changes and deal with the growing retirement and health needs of, of our elderly population. 
I mean, if, if there's something that would have to be done on a bipartisan basis, it would have to be that. But just in terms of political philosophy, it's a, a flat across the board tax, you, in you my opinion. You're not included in this bill, then. So, sorry? You, you, would, you would not be in favor of including the Moynihan proposal in this? Oh, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think that's a much more complex and long, you know, I think you have to address that with the long term uh, uh, financial annuity needs of our retirees and their health needs. Uh, you have to factor those two in. And this whole intergenerational transfer and potential intergenerational conflict uh, that, that we're going to face when our generation, uh, the when man. Our, our generation are the ones that are going to be the recipient of these benefits. Because, as you know, the we can get into you know, es yeah. esoteric economic discussions here, but there, there are fewer workers and, and there, there are more beneficiaries. And it's, it's a problem that either we deal with or our, or our children are going to be stuck uh, filling the bill. Any questions? Mr. Major Chairman, I, I'd just like to uh, thank Mr. Donnelly. In, in every tax bill, there are unintended consequences. And I think that you've done us a great service in pointing out now that there would be people in exactly the same income group, exactly the same uh, level in our society who would be treated differently merely as a result of tying this tax credit to the Social Security tax. And I can see why that was done. It has some very positive economic ramifications, but it also would treat people uh, inequitably for, for no real legitimate reason. And uh, I certainly would uh, support the uh, amendment that you're offering and would point out that uh, in Missouri, in fact, it would affect uh, several thousand teachers who have uh, not been part of the Social Security system because they, they're in an equally acceptable alternative pension plan. And there's no reason why they should be treated differently. I just don't want any member to get whipsawed by this one, it, and it's happened in the past. And this, I, I know that the, the chairman has instructed his staff uh, to see if there's a way that we can work this out. And I guess we have a few hours to do so. And I, I really appreciate well, that'd it. That would be great, because I know how hard you've worked uh, on this matter over the years. Just never seems to go away, Joe. I know. I know. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, you. Brian. The Honorable David Obey. Yeah, nice guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, just a moment to get my act together here. Chairman, I'm here for two basic reasons. Number one, because like you, I care about my country and uh, because also I care about my party. And I think my party is about to make a major mistake on an important issue uh, of, of taxation. Since the budget summit agreement uh, two years ago, uh, the Democratic Party in this country has correctly demanded that we do something to correct uh, the basic unfairness in the tax code which uh, has added uh, gravy to the cream for the very wealthy at the expense of everybody else in the society. You will remember that summit debate. This chart demonstrates what happened. This chart demonstrates what the distributional effects were of the tax increases in that summit agreement that was first brought to us in, uh, in 1980. As you can see, for persons who, ra who made less than $10,000 a year, their tax was increased by 7.5%. Middle-income people from twenty dollars to $50,000 had their tax in, in that summit agreement raised by uh, 3%. People who made more than $200,000 a year had their taxes raised by half that amount. We thought that was unfair. We brought that summit down. And on our side of the aisle, I think it's fair to say the Congressman Byron Dorgan and I uh, led the effort to bring it down to the considerable consternation of both the White House and the bipartisan leadership of both parties. This chart shows what was produced as a result of that event. We turned it around. Instead of having a 7.5% increase in taxes for people who made less than $10,000 a year, we had a tax cut of 2%. Not much, but a whole lot better than a big increase. <clears throat> we cut the tax hit on people from twenty to 50000 by 50% from the original summit. And we did what we ought to do for people who made more than $200,000 a year. We raised their taxes by 6.5% rather than 1.7%, so that we brought the tax code a little more close, uh, or, or a little closer to equity. 
But the fact remains that the wealthy have still gained a tremendous amount at the expense of everybody else in the society. And I think that what we are in danger of doing is seeing us, um, instead of continuing on in the tradition of that budget debate in 81, I mean in uh, our uh, two, uh, two years ago when we brought the summit agreement down, instead we are seeing both parties inexorably moved in, move into the bidding war that occurred in 1981. And I want to read what happened in 81, not in my words, but in the words of the author of the package, David Stockman. Stockman said uh, uh, that we got the budget deficit projections in the administration back Graham Latta budget, quote, down to $31 billion by hook or by crook, mostly the latter. Not my words, Mr. Stockman's. Then <coughs> Stockman said, Kemp Roth was always a Trojan horse to bring down the top rate. It's kind of hard to sell trickle down, so the supply side formula was the only way to get a tax policy that was really trickle down. Supply side is trickle down theory. And as my old friend from Wisconsin legislative days used to say, a supply side means that the poor and the rich get the same amount of ice, but the poor get theirs in the winter time. Um, what happened was that Mr. Stockman originally announced that we were going after weak claims on federal dollars. But in the end, what happened is that the 81 budget went after the weak claimants, not the weak claims. We created tremendous injustices, and we had a quadrupling of federal deficits. And I tried to stop it then. I had an alternative not only to the President's package, but I had an alternative to the Ways and Means Committee Democratic package as well. We got clobbered. We're probably going to get clobbered this time. But we were right. A majority of Democrats voted for my package in 81, and we're right now in wanting to see changes in that Democratic package. Let me tell you why I want to see changes. In the charts that are passed out, by the Democratic, uh, or by the Ways and Means Committee. Those charts indicate that in contrast to the deficits under the President's proposal and the Republican substitute over the five-year period, they indicate that the Democratic package will in fact be in surplus by $13 billion over that time period. The problem, however, is when you get beyond that five-year time period, then you wind up with a very big payoff for some very high income people. And the telltale signs is that in the, in the uh, Ways and Means package, as now constituted, we, uh, the, that package, once you pay for the middle class tax cut, which is temporary for the first two years, then you see the cost growing. It drops to 3.3 in 94, goes up to 8.6 in 95. In 96 and 97, it goes up to $12 billion and then $20 billion. That tells you there's an explosion there in terms of benefits past that five-year time frame. Our best estimate of what that package costs over the next 20 years because of the capital gains provision in that bill which emulates and imitates the President's desires to give away everything in the country to the rich. What that, what, what that so-called democratic alternative does is over the 20-year period cost over $300 billion in lost revenue to the Treasury as the cost of that capital gains gift explodes. I do not believe the Democratic Party ought to be doing that, and I'm not going to vote for it. Second reason that I think that package needs to be changed is that if you take, the second, take a look at the second chart, which is being distributed by the Ways and Means Committee, it indicates that uh, for persons who make more than $200,000 a year, that the average tax uh, increase will be $14,300, and that the average tax benefit from the capital gains provision will be $8,300, implying that there is still a hit on high-income people. That's true in that five-year period. But once you move out beyond that five-year wall, 
what happens is that within a few years, the 35 percent tax cut, no, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, the, the, the tax rate increased to 35 percent on high income people, no longer raises enough money to pay for the cost of the benefits which are going to be provided under the capital gains provision long term. And so in fact, what is a short-term tax increase for very high-income people becomes a long-term tax cut for the very rich. And I do not believe that that is where the Democratic Party stands, and I think that we have to see that change. Now, my first preference, I'm here today with the request that you make in order my amendment, which would simply return the capital gains provision to the kind of middle-income middle targeted capital gains provision that Chairman Rostenkowski uh, had in his original package, with one exception. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that if you want to get into it. But what I, that, so I'm here asking you to make that amendment in order so that we can cut the long-term drain on the Treasury that would come from that capital gains provision in the Ways and Means package. But if we can't, but that's really not my first, uh, first choice. My first choice would simply be to have the committee change the bill on its own to eliminate that drain. What our amendment would do is simply say that over your lifetime you get a $200,000 exclusion from taxation under capital gains if you've held an asset for three years or longer. And it applies prospectively, not retroactively. So that we would reward investments made by middle income people over a long period of time uh, but, but we would not be rewarding speculation. You'd have to hold an asset three years. When I say we, I'm here on behalf of myself and Congressman Sable. Um, and uh, I should note that Congressman Dorgan in the committee tried to do, uh, do uh, uh, something similar. I think we need to remove from our bill the incentives uh, for uh, a short-term uh, uh, holding of, of assets. And uh, let me make it perfectly clear. I do want to be able to vote for a middle income tax cut. In contrast to those on the Republican side of the aisle who are opposed to that, I helped start that baby. Uh, we helped start it in the fight in the budget uh, two years ago. And Congressman Downey and Miller and I helped start it when we introduced the uh, child credit uh, provision which Senator uh, Gore offered in the Senate. So I want that. My, uh, my, my goals are clear on this. But the price that we are being asked to pay to get it is too high because this package out of ways and means is a two-year middle-class tax cut and after that five-year period it's a long-term gift to the rich. And I think the Democratic Party can do better than that. And so what I'm asking you to do is to help us to avoid a mini bidding war similar to that which we were in in 1981. Thank God, as Democrats, we ought to thank God that the Ways and Means package didn't pass in 81. Because the Democratic Party would have had the responsibility for the mess that occurred in terms of the triple, uh, tripling and quadrupling of our debt and our deficits if that had happened. Because as, as I said at the time, it would have been cheaper in 1981 Rather than passing either of the two bills, it would have been cheaper if we'd simply given everybody in the country three wishes. It'd been a whole lot cheaper. And so what I'm asking you to, and I, ju I just have to say, I'm not ideologically opposed to capital gains uh, 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 exemptions, provided they're targeted at the right people and provided they're paid for. Uh, but I find it ironic that at the very moment in our history, when the disastrous results of the supply side Reagan Bush binge of the 80s are now falling on the shoulders of every American, precisely at that moment, we apparently have a significant faction of our own party that wants to join the Republican Party in saying that the way out of this mess is to do it again. And I don't believe that's the truth. And so I think, gentlemen, that yes, we owe our party our support. I think. There are not many people around here who give their support more loyally to, the, to our party than I do. But on an issue like this, we owe our party more than its support. We owe them the truth. And the fact is that the truth is that the package out of ways and means is not what it pretends to be. 
at least not long term. And so I ask you as a second best to make my amendment in order so at least I can try to reduce the devastating impact to the, de uh, to the Treasury long term and so that we can try to at least redirect some of those gains to middle income people. And if, but more than that, I simply want to ask you to, I think, meet what is your highest duty to our own party by telling our leadership that they have to, uh, have to tell the Ways and Means Committee that they must change this bill. If we want to earn the right to govern this country, we simply have to do better than that bill does. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Robin? Any questions? Mr. McEwen, any questions? Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. The committee will be in recess till the hour of 2.30. At this point, committee members took a lunch break and then reconvened later in the day to hear several more hours of testimony by members of Congress. You can see that testimony and more views on the legislation when the full House takes up the economic growth packages tomorrow afternoon. And of course, we will be there to bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of those proceedings. They begin at 12 noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. if you're on the West Coast. Coming up in just a few moments on C-SPAN, it's debate from the United States Senate today over U.S. trade policy with China. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by American...